So I'm going to call a meeting to order. I'm going to ask if, uh, would you lead us? Yes, I'm going to do roll call first, then, then we'll lead. <laughs> okay. Council Member Mauer? Here. Council Member Thomas? Here. Mayor Breeden? Here. Vice Mayor Acton? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Sanders, are you online? Yeah, I'm online. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All present. Okay. Okay, and the approval of the agenda? Be correct. We didn't have any changes. So moved. Second. Council Member Mauer? Aye. Council Member Thomas? Aye. Mayor Breeden? Aye. Vice Mayor Acton? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Sanders? Approval aye. of the agenda? She said aye. Okay, I'll approve. Okay, now the. Uh, we have no city returners report on closed session, but we do have another report. I'm going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. My, my book is mixed up. I, I, my apologies. Jessica, if you would, please. It is by uh, the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Do you have anyone? Well, I'm just going to ask you to uh, uh, stand and and remember all of the people who do so much for us, all our service people, our, um, our, our law enforcement people, and all of us who do things for other people. If you have had something wonderful done for you recently, please remember them and say thank you. A moment silence, please. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to do the city attorney's report because I have it right on the right page. Well, I have a suggestion to make. I, I'd like to give you guys a brief report on the uh, JPA formation, uh, but I note we've got some presentations and, and so on. I don't know if we want to keep people around. For my, you may have questions about it, so my, my suggestion was maybe we push it back to later on the agenda. That's fine with all of us. Anybody have any problem with that? Okay, thank you. We will, then we'll do it after our presentations. Okay. All right, the first one is a presentation <clears throat> of uh, service employee awards and council, if you'd all join me up at the, and staff. I'd like to ask uh, Ron Strand, William Mills, and Harold Jacobson to please come forward. You're it, huh? Um, uh, Harold Jacobson has served five years with the city, and uh, William Mills has served ten years. But Ron, Ron Strand, come up here. <laughs> Ron Strand has served 30 years here in the city. Uh, I was on the city council 30 years ago when you were hired, and uh, I'm glad to be able to see you um, progress through the ranks, and now you're the chief, and really appreciate all your service through the years. Thank well, you thank very you. much. So great. We don't have an award to present you. Oh, that's okay. Later. Would you like to say a few words? Sure, might as well. Yeah. Won't get away with not saying a few words. <laughs> yeah, it's been uh, 30 years uh, since I came here. 30 years ago, I was only planning on staying a couple of years, and uh, that changed uh, shortly after I got here. Uh, met my wife, had a family, a uh, great community, uh, had opportunities to go elsewhere over the years, and decided to stay. Um, you know, I plan on making this place my home when I retire after a few years, and you know, I'm just appreciative of uh, having the opportunity to work here as long as I have, and have the opportunity to rise through the ranks to be chief. And um, had a lot of mentors over the years, and um, you know, thank you very much. I, I might say I think Ron is the only city employee that I've actually attended his wedding reception. So,
Okay, the next item is the presentation by the Ridgecrest Area Convention and Visitors Bureau of the annual Petrico Festival Report. And I understand, Mr. Brocky, you're going to lead us in that? Well, as I told Pastor Eddie, my dad was Mr. Brocky. I'm just Harris. <laughs> but uh, Mayor Breeden and members of City Council, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to present some information on the Petroglyph Festival. I apologize because I have some notes on my notes, so I'll be flipping these as we go along here. Uh, before I even begin, just to clarify something, this is not a presentation by the RACVB. This is a presentation by the Petroglyph Education Foundation, which, which is a separate 501c3. So just want to make sure we know that. Um, we're kind of tied together at the hip, but we work for them or with them, but, but it is a separate found, uh, 501c3. Thank you, sir. Next slide, please. What we're going to cover in the presentation is, uh, as you can see up there, the venues, information on each, comments by vendors and merchants, lessons learned by this second festival, and uh, we certainly are taking those lessons learned to heart and are going to hopefully make improvements to the third annual Petroglyph Festival, and a financial in impact to the city and the local businesses. Uh, so those are the items we're going to cover. Next slide, please. Okay, the list of the venues is uh, on Friday evening there was a dinner dance. Um, I thought I just talked about that one. I'm sorry. Yeah, the list of the venues, there was a dinner dance kickoff at the historic USO building on Friday night. Uh, technically it wasn't a part of the planned weekend, but uh, thanks to uh, um, the uh, Optimist Club, we had that event and it was very well attended and so on. And then we had an education component, which is basically eighth graders um, going through and learning about petroglyphs and so on. Petroglyph tours, we had a powwow on Saturday, Sunday. We had a street fair at, uh, Bals on Balsam Street Saturday and Sunday. Gem and Mineral Show at the fairgrounds on Saturday and Sunday. And then the community days at on base on Saturday. So. Next slide. The uh, dinner dance was held at the historic USO building on, on Friday the 6th, and it was sponsored by the Optimist Club, and they served about 100 barbecue meals, and they had about 125 in attendance with a live band, and I understand. They, I wasn't there, but I understand they had a good time, so. Next slide. The education component, which was basically uh, it's held for eighth grade students, and there was 450 kids approximately that were involved in this. It was not the same weekend as the Petroglyph Festival. I believe it was a couple of weeks prior, if I remember correctly. And the kids learn a lot of things. They learn about the history of the creation of petroglyphs by Native Americans. They actually created some paper petroglyphs, and between them they did an interpretation of what the meaning of the petroglyphs was and discuss the proper care of the environment to make sure we have, uh, you know, don't damage the petroglyphs in the future. And uh, very worthwhile for the kids. They need to understand our heritage, and I think it was very well done. And uh, Shannon Grove was there on Saturday and was very uh, appreciative of what was going on, and she was very supportive of it. So that meant a lot to the kids and to us, frankly. Next slide. Only apologizing once on this, so it's maybe I guess twice. Petroglyph tours, we had intended to have those on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but the weather was bad, so Friday's tours were canceled uh, because of rain up in the Petroglyph area. So, but there were tours on both Saturday and Sunday. We had 180 visitors uh, taking part in the tour. It was a mini tour because we were cycling through uh, with three uh, vans and in terms of scheduling and getting a maximum number of people up there, we had uh, tours that only were about 90 minutes, I believe, each. They drive up, spend about 90 minutes to come back. Uh, base personnel were involved in uh, making sure that 
we told people what they could do and shouldn't do when they're up in the Petrocliff Canyon, just like it's done for the regular tours. Uh, and the base and museum escorts were at the site to serve as the escorts for the tour. And as I mentioned, it was abbreviated tours because of the wanting to be, get a number of people through the tours. What was nice is uh, the people who went through the abbreviated tours were very happy to get up there. And many, if not most of them, want to come back and do the full tour, which is, of course, part of what we want to do is get people to come back to the community and not only see the petroglyph tours, but also see other things of interest in the surrounding area. And the feedback from, the, like I say, our guests was excellent. There was nobody that was saying, how come we are only up here for an hour and a half? Contrary to what you may have heard from some other places, that was just not true. Uh, next slide. The inner tribal of powwow, uh, there were approximately 5,000 people here on the weekend. Some were here just Saturday, some just Sunday, and some both days. There were, uh, I think, I didn't get the exact number, but eight to 10 Native American groups involved. 150 performers, about 100 on Saturday, and about 50 on Sunday. And they served about 2,000 meals that were, I understand, were very good. I didn't get to that. We were both basically working, so we didn't get to do very much except work, which was fine. And there were 23 vendor booths at the powwow. And uh, I should have said at the beginning, if you have questions, you can either ask them now or you can ask them when it's I'm done. So either way Thank is fine. You. Next slide. The Balsam Street Fair was both Saturday and Sunday. We had about 9,500 people in attendance for the weekend. And there were 98 vendor booths. We had a car show with 35 entries. And we had uh, a wine walk in the <coughs> evening with 300 people participating and seven wineries participating. And I believe every one of the seven wineries said they want to come back again. And we hope to have more than seven this, this year. So, next. Gem and Mineral Show, I don't have a lot of information on that, but that was held on Saturday and Sunday also at the fairgrounds. And they had about 2,000 people in attendance. And I might add, um, made this presentation to the RACV meeting, the meeting this morning, and we're gonna to try to capture more information in subsequent years as to how many out-of-town people versus how many in-town people. I don't really have a good feel for that right now. We do know the number, or we, I should say we're accumulating the number of hotels, guests for the weekend, and of course they would be out-of-towners. Next. Community Days was held on base on Saturday, and they had about 3,500 visitors. So you can see there were a lot of people involved. Some, of course, some of the numbers are the same people. So I'm not saying it was, you don't add these together, but about 3,500 of the people were on, on Community Days, and many of them came in for the festival also. And 10 volunteer organizations, base-related group, nonprofit, basically, uh, served refreshments at Community Days. So um, next. Uh, there were lectures at the Old Town Theater, and there were seven lectures on Saturday and five on Sunday. You can see the topics there. Um, I might indicate that most of those lectures were done both Saturday and Sunday. So um, uh, five of the seven were done on Sunday, but all, all seven of those were done on Saturday. And they had 175 people participating in that, so um, modest size group, but it, the people that were there were very interested in what they were being uh, talked to about. Next. Vendor survey results. We, uh, we uh, surveyed all the vendors, and I might add, almost all of the vendors gave us feedback. Matter of fact, I think there was only one vendor that had a language problem, and therefore they didn't provide comments back, but all the rest of the vendors did. And you can see the vendor uh, event size, about three quarters of them said the size of the event was about what they expected. Crowd size, roughly 60% felt that way. Sales, um, about half of the people said it was more, more sales than expected or about what they expected, and the other half said not so much. Will they return next year? Uh, basically 88% either said yes or maybe, so that's pretty good. 
And you can see the comments at the bottom there. There were comments, like I said at the beginning, we're going to take these comments to heart and do as many things as we can to improve what they would like us to do differently. Uh, sometimes the comments were uh, contradictory. One might say it should be a one-day event, and another one says, I'm glad it was a two-day event, so we can't, you know, we can't satisfy both of those. But we certainly can do things to make the festival this coming year even better. Um, like, you know, for example, was it open too late? We're going to consider whether we want to change the hours or not. But we haven't made those decisions yet, but we're taking the input, or we will take the input. Next. Merchant surveys. Uh, every one of the merchants gave us feedback, which is pretty great. Um, you can see that the business traffic, uh, that was ab about a third of the people said the uh, business traffic was less than they expected. About a third said about the same as they expected, and the remaining third said it was more than, expect than they expected, so for whatever that's worth. Um, sales by the business on, on uh, Balsam Street, 50% um, thought it was less than they expected, and the other 50% was the same or more than they expected. So. Again, um, nobody was complaining. They basically thought it was a positive event for the area. Almost 80% said it was positive for the community. And 60% said it was positive for their business, even if they didn't have high sales. I think it's important to understand that whether they had a lot of sales or not, they had a lot of people coming and walking through and maybe walking through their place of business. And who knows, come back later and buy. But. Um, most, like I say, most people thought it was a good event, good for the community. That's the comments below there kind of say. Next. Unaccustomed as I am to wanting to talk about negative things, it's important that we do it. So I'm not going to read all of these, but you can see uh, what they are and if... Uh, you know, like I say, some said have the event on Saturday only, and some said we liked the fact that it was on both days. Um, some said there were too many events for the weekend, and we have definitely decided we're going to change that. Um, we had the education component on one weekend, and then we had the uh, street fair, the powwow, the community days, et cetera, on the second weekend. We're going to have things over three weekends this next year. For example, the education component will be one weekend. The powwow will be a second weekend, not necessarily a week later, but a second weekend. And then the uh, street fair and the Petrical Festival stuff on the third weekend. So we're definitely going to do that, at least I'm pretty sure we're definitely going to do that. Um, and I won't go through the rest of them. You can see what the rest of them say. Next. Some of the metrics here, a little bit mind-boggling, but I, this is put up here so you can get an idea of how many people potentially could have heard about Ridgecrest and the Petroglyph Festival. And we're not saying 88, people, 88 million people heard about it, but there was an audience potential of 88 million people. That's pretty mind-boggling. But, you know, if 1% of them heard it, that's 800,000 people that know about Ridgecrest that may not have known about Ridgecrest before. Here, so I have a question on that, if I may. Sure. Um, I, the 88 million, was there any way to calculate how much, of, how much saturation there was in a particular area? Were there areas that were oversaturated? Um, and of those 88 million people, did any of them that came, did they say we saw it here, we saw it there? Um, it, okay, so the first question, uh, I don't have a real good feel on where the areas were, although it was primar primarily in the southwest United States, but also in, I mean, there was other areas like Florida and so on, but primarily in the southwest United States. Um, and yes, we did get quite a few people saying they had heard about it on such and such radio station or such and such magazine or whatever, and they came because they thought it sounded interesting and they were very happy they came. It's good when um, you get the now, positive feedback. The, the next thing is uh, we expect 
for the most part that people won't come year back year after year to see the festival every time. But the fact is they come once at least. They go home and say, hey, we had a great time, and they talk to their neighbors, and maybe their neighbors will come back. And maybe all of them will come back at a later date to do something else that they found was available to do in the area. That's the whole idea, is to get people to understand Ridgecrest has a lot to offer. So, Thank you. That answer? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the last... Um, I'm sorry, not the last. Lessons learned. I'm getting ahead of myself here. <clears throat> One of the things we learned is that we had too many venues for a single weekend, which I, which I already mentioned. And uh, I, also, I guess I already mentioned also that we're going to have three separate weekends this year and hopefully subsequent years. And the last bullet there shouldn't say consider not having community days. It should say consider not having community days on the same weekend because we felt there was a need to... There's really no reason to have them on the same weekend. Next slide. Okay, this one, <clears throat> we're going to redo this one, but what this one currently is, it shows the TOT, DAC, TOT tax and the 2% uh, that the uh, uh, Petroglyph Festival gets, or actually it goes to the RACVB, I guess, doesn't it? Yeah, so the 2% that the city pays to the RACVB, the RTID, is for the entire month of November. Okay. It's not for the weekend. Um, but 2013 was the year prior to the first festival. 2014, of course, therefore, was the first festival. And 2015 was the second annual festival. It's kind of nice to say second annual. Um, like it'll be nice to say the third annual. Uh, but that is the entire month of November. So the numbers are correct, but they're for the whole month. And, of course, not everything was, the increases were not all because of the Petrova Festival. But you can see the increases for the month were pretty good. Um, what we're going to do, and I'd like to come back in a couple of weeks, we are capturing the information from the STAR report to show the room nights for the weekend of the festival. I'm sorry, for 2013, the room nights for whatever the weekend would have been for the festival, and then the room nights for the first festival that same weekend, and the room nights for the second festival. So we'll be able to bring that back to you, and you can get a more precise feel for what was the actual benefit, room nights, and, and uh, also restaurants, et cetera, for the Petroglyph Festival itself. That was one of my concerns because when I saw that figure, I yeah. went, my goodness, the yeah. $8,000 we gave you certainly was returned to us yeah. well, in like a to, number of folks. I'd like to say that, but, but I think you're going to see that it was well worth your time. Your I'm not anyway. saying it wasn't. I no. just thought it couldn't have been that many yeah. people. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Um, but I'm glad. Thank you for clarifying that. Well, uh, it got clarified to me, so I said, well, we need to get come back with the corrected okay. number. So we will do that in a couple, three weeks when it well, obviously a couple or four weeks since you don't meet every week, uh, to give you the more precise information. It'll be interesting to see that because then all of those people who invested both in booths and, and in, yeah. the, in the event will be able to see these are the exact dollars you're gonna, that was you're returned gonna see, here. You're going to see, as far as I'm concerned, I'm pretty sure you're going to see some significant dollars even just for that weekend. That's and, of course, it's really not – we can't say the Petroglyph Festival – had everything to do with it because there might have been other things also and we recognize that but we have to at least say we want to talk about the, the three day weekend that's the appropriate weekend okay. and I used the two and a half to one ratio in terms of um, businesses within, or sales within town relative to hotel sales so that's, that's I think that's pretty um, it's usually more than that it's usually more than a two and a half to one ratio so I think that's being uh, I think it's more than that. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Anyway, that's the presentation. I'd be happy to uh, address questions if you may have. Any questions from council? Go ahead. Thank you, by the way, Harris, for putting this together. I just wanted to wait till you were done for my questions. Um, and I saw a couple of references to this, and, and I want to kind of get a feel for it because I know how it was on the other side being down there for both festivals. Um, the vendor comments about 
only on Saturday or Saturday only as compared to the year before because we did have such a huge crowd that day, whereas it was spread out over two days. But if I read this right, our attendance seemed to be up this year over last year. Or it was up in total. To be, yeah, right? I think it was up in total. Um, so do you think it was because at least the comments that I had heard from vendors were because we didn't have that big rush like we did the prior year. I mean, we knew when community days ended because we had that giant influx of people come down on the street. So do you think that contributes to them not wanting to have it for two days? Um, or do you think it many, was just the... Many, many of the merchants weren't on, open on Sunday. They were open Saturday, but not Sunday. Some were open both days. But um, I'm not sure their rationale of why they thought it should just be Saturday. But, I, you know, it's a lot of extra work. I mean, there's benefits sure. of having it, but uh, if they're not open Sunday, um, they thought it was a good event for both week, both days, but they just suggested it be Saturday only. I didn't I didn't get into their head as to why they said that, but that was a comment. Okay. Um, um, my other question is on the school children and the education component. Mm -hmm. um, are, is the plan, in, at least in the future, um, to branch out beyond our school district um, and to bring in other schools? And are we looking at holding that education component? Mm -hmm. A few days well, over an entire weekend. I don't know if we uh, we haven't met yet for this upcoming festival. We probably have our first meeting next month, uh, so I I don't know the answer to that at this point. What I do know is that 400 and some kids from this area, and I think Cal City as well as this area, and, and as well as uh, Inukur and so on, is a lot of kids. And doing more than that, it, there's, there's got to be some kind of a constraint on it because there's volunteers doing this, and that's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So, But I don't know the answer to your question. Um, I know there's going to be a discussion of expanding it, but whether we do it or not, I'm not sure. Okay. It would be great, you know, from, to get kids in from out of town and, and do it. But So we can see the benefit of it, mm -hmm. but we're working here with volunteers, and it's kind of hard to tell them they've got to do more work. I totally understand that. Yeah. As one of those volunteers, I, I get that completely. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to fire a volunteer. <laughs> um, I think that's, I had one other one, but I'm going to let others ask questions while I find it, because I wrote it down while you were talking. Thank okay. you. Okay. Anybody else? No one else? Yes. Jim, do you have anything you want to say? Yeah, I've got a question. Um, do you do you have a feel for if the attendance at the Petrical Fest is being heard or? You're breaking up. How that? Jim, you're going to have to say that again. We can't hear you. Okay, let me try this again. Better. Well, that's much better. <laughs> okay. Is, do you have a feel for if the attendance for the uh, Petrical Festival is trending upward or is it staying about the same? Well, we'll know that when we do the comparison for the weekend versus, you know, the appropriate weekend before we had festivals. We really can't do that now, and that's what I was talking about with the financial impact for the entire month of November. It doesn't tell us that story. And so we need to do it for the appropriate weekend, uh, and then we'll be able to hone in on that a little bit better. Oh, I see. So tracking the uh, hotel... Um, what do you call them? The hotel vacancies or the well, ho bet, how many rooms are rented out? Room nights, I guess, is what they call it. Yeah. Yeah, but we can't okay. we can't take credit for room nights for the entire month of November since because the festival was only on that three day weekend. So. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there any other comments or questions? Okay, thank you, Harris, and I. We will then go to the next presentation by the uh, Ridgecrest Area Visitors and Convention Bureau of the Annual Financial Report. And um, that, sir, is you. You all have a copy of the uh, report? <clears throat> This report is um, October 1 of 
of 14 to the end of September 30th of 2015. So keep that in mind when I talk you through this. So it has nothing to do with what's going forward past that October 1 that's in this report. And this report, all this is, the council has to do is just file it. You don't have to make any decision. It's just a report that the, my board of directors have seen, have gone over, and our auditors have, have groomed it, and now it's to file. To file. Uh, we have to file one with the state and with you, and it, that's all we do is file, okay? So just want to clear that up. That was a question I wanted to ask staff to make sure. We're not accepting this as get, no intentions meant that it isn't invalid, but we, we're just simply saying that not every one of these figures have been audited by us, but they are have been audited by Berkey and Cox, and we are accepting them as presented. Exactly. Is that correct? Okay. Okay, in the report, uh, there's several line items. If you go to the second page, you have the boundaries, which we have to look at. Uh, the boundaries uh, have not changed. So in that line item, if we had changed the boundaries of the city, expanded out for, for some reason, and there was an additional <laughs> hotel, that would be added in there. Or even if you changed the boundaries, I'd have to change the, the, the district. But it has not changed, as we know. The activities, number two, improvement in activities for 1415. Um, you can read the first three, but the bottom is we went to trade shows, uh, events including the International Powwow, um, the California Film Locations Conference, LA Travel Adventure Show, and the AVCI Show in Los Angeles. Actually, it's Studio City. The uh, total estimate cost breakdown for 1415 is on attachment B. Okay, number five, um, the amount of surplus and deficit is kind of a, a sticky widget for us. And why that's in there is if you can't carry only a certain percentage forward in the district, that they don't, the state doesn't want you to hold a tremendous amount of money. The money is to be used to spend for promoting, marketing the district. So what I want to point out to the council is that in 13-14, we carried forward $1,463. If you look at the, you see that we carried 77,000 or 547 forward. Now that takes us out as the percentage that we're allotted in the district. Well, because we can explain ourselves through this, it's okay. And what that means is 55000 was on the books for the sign, which hadn't been paid for at that time, at the time that this was audited. So you take 55000 away from that number. Away from the seventy-seven. Right. And also, see, the auditors can only report in this report as they see it at that time. They can't just guess, well, this, you know, that has to, so that's why it's in there. The second is, is that the city paid, which was been, been corrected, but is, was paid in that time frame. I got paid twice for the district for, I think it was September, September I believe. September. So that number was on the books at that time. So that adds in there. So at the end, if you put, put those two in there, you can explain yourself through that, which the state would, would be okay with it, then the percentage is within the 5% of the district, okay? Since that time, has washed itself through because we've purchased the sign and we've recorrected, so, so that would be, would be fine. So that, you just have to show that if somebody asks that question, why are you carrying such a heavy load of money forward? And you, it's easy to explain your way through that. Okay, um, contributions. Uh, number six, um, we had, as you can see, was film permits, 3,700. Membership dues, the 7,100. And City of Eric Trish was the 8,000 for the Petroglyph Festival. 
You can see the objectives for 2016 at appendix right behind appendix B. You can look at that. It's in your document. And those, and I'm not going to go through those. You can read those on your own, but it's the marketing objectives that we're going to be doing for the next period. That ends my report. Is there any questions from council? Any other comments? Accept and file. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Um, Mr. Lemieux, back to you. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to talk um, a little bit tonight about the progress on forming the JPA for purposes of satisfying uh, the Groundwater Sustainability Act. Uh, as you'll recall, at a prior meeting, you authorized our offices to begin that process of negotiation, and we've done so. Um, I just want to let you know, we don't have anything close to a document yet, but I wanted to let you know that we've had some favorable movement and um, highlight a couple of the issues that came up. I don't know if they're going to be significant issues going forward, but I thought you'd want to be appraised of them. Now, bear in mind that while I'm doing this work, I'm letting the other parties know that all I'm offering them is that uh, I can produce a document to you folks uh, when the time comes with my recommendation that it be approved. But ultimately, uh, the city council is going to be the one, obviously, to approve the document. And therefore, all of the terms of the document will be subject to your review and comment and so on at that point. Um, so for that reason, I'm not coming forward with every individual issue as it comes up. Instead, I, I'm hoping to sort of keep you informed uh, through these kinds of updates. And then when the time comes to adopt the, uh, the JPA agreement, we'll have a more robust discussion. Um, so I think the topic that was of concern uh, when we brought this up last time was the role of uh, the farming interests and the mutual water companies and the mine. And uh, I'm pleased to report that uh, we seem to still be working on a, a, a mutually agreeable solution. Um, it appears still that that group has uh, accepted the idea of sitting on a development committee which is a committee that would review the uh, groundwater sustainability plan prior to it being adopted. Uh, we're going to meet uh, by phone tomorrow with some of their attorneys and sort of discuss some of those details, but my sense right now is that it's, it's moving in a cooperative way forward. Uh, a couple other issues that have come up. One was um, there was an issue, it may have been an accidental issue, about whether or not uh, the, the individuals that sit on the Joint Powers Board be elected officials or not. And the way that came up was I think the county was sort of presuming that it would be elected officials and the Water District was sort of presuming that they would appoint their general manager who they felt had the length of experience and sort of the institutional memory to, to serve well on that board. Uh, we had some discussion about that at a public meeting, was it last Friday, Madam Mayor, or a week ago last Friday? Friday. Time's going by too fast for me. And uh, it wasn't clear whether or not that was going to ultimately be an issue. The, after it was discussed a bit, the uh, Water District said that they would go back and give it some more thought. They just hadn't really thought it through. So I don't know if this elected official thing will be an issue or not, but I just wanted to let you know that it was being discussed. Uh, another issue that's being discussed is um, the way that um, uh, votes will be counted among the board. And the reason that's an issue is at present it looks like there's five parties that are interested in sitting on the board, the city, the county, the water district, uh, community services district, which is rather small, and Inyo right. County. It does not appear right now that San Bernardino County is interested in being on the board. And Inyo County and the, uh, the, the Community Services District are very small. So there's a concern that by having them on the board voting that they're giving a disproportionate uh, weight to those parties as opposed to everybody else in the basin. Sort of an unequal vote, I guess you could say. And so we're discussing, we haven't come up with any particular solution to that issue. It's just been raised. We're going to talk about it tomorrow and uh, see if we can work up a, a solution that sort of takes that into consideration. Um, I have a sense there's another issue, and I forget. Am I forgetting something, Madam Mayor? The only other one was um, the, how the money was going to be appropriated, and it wasn't discussed, but it was 
intimated that there might be some disproportionate right yeah the there's dollars. there's uh, the issue is that uh, when the entity is first operating someone's going to have to advance some costs in order for it to function presumably those will be reimbursed through whatever assessment is adopted and the various stakeholders have not yet discussed how that's going to happen so that's another discussion what we have yet to have so we've got uh, a pair of phone calls tomorrow and we've got a very elaborate schedule that has us coming back to you guys with a final agreement I think in if I'm not mistaken in June finalization was going to be the last week so it would be our June meeting yeah yes, your June you. meeting so uh, any questions about that any questions from any questions from the public okay thank, thank you. you sir all right we will then continue on the meeting in the normal order and uh, this is the time for public comment Persons wishing to address the council on matters that are within the council's jurisdiction and do not already appear on the agenda may do so at this time. Pursuant to the Brown Act, the city council may not take action on that item that does not appear on the agenda. Speakers are limited to five minutes. The public comment section of the agenda is limited to a total of one hour. Each speaker is asked to provide his or her name. Public comment, please. Dan Rotora, good evening. <clears throat> I'm holding in this hand a copy of resolution number 1049. That is the document that allowed the city to borrow up to $3.3 million from the wastewater fund to build the solar plant. The, the resolution is quite clear. It was a five-year loan due and payable uh, at latest June of 2015. As a matter of fact, it would be June 16th of 2015. Now it turns out, and I don't know if there's correlation or not, but on the following day, June 17th of 2015, this city council raised the sewer fees by 40%. That was the largest sewer fee increase I believe the city has ever had. Um, and you can go back and look at resolution 1049 if you'd like to. It's on the June 16th city council meeting. Um, my feeling is it's totally inappropriate for the city to default on loans to the wastewater fund, but still claim that there is money required to increase the reserve of the wastewater fund uh, and provide or instigate a 40% increase in the fees. Um, I would like to see, and by the way, there's also another loan outstanding. There's a total of 6.2, I believe, million dollars that the city owes the wastewater fund. Um, I would like to see an agenda item on the city council uh, that discusses why the city is owing $6.2 million to the wastewater fund but is still raising the fees on the public and why that's happening and how the city is going to correct that. My feeling is we need to roll back the current fees to something that is reasonable uh, and that's going to require some discussion uh, and some understanding of where we are how much money we have, how much we need, uh, and what the city is going to do to pay back the $6.2 million. So, my, so I'm suggesting and requesting that this whole topic be agendized on a city council meeting and have the staff give us some indication of what's really happening to the wastewater fund. Any questions? I just want to make a comment, Stan. I, I understand what you're saying, but this council did not raise the fees 40%. They were already raised by a previous council. We just put them on the tax rolls. Um, right. Yes, I, I understand that the Prop 218 hearing that authorized the increase originally was um, done by the council previously, and I believe it was 2012. 
But at that hearing, I believe the city council did have the option to either instigate or initiate the whole, the whole increase or part of the increase or none of the increase. So I, I appreciate the distinction. Uh, it was still within the discretion of the council uh, to not put the whole increase. And, and quite frankly, there was, in my mind, never has been any justification for that last increase. But I, I, I get your point. Any other council comment? Okay. Um, I, I just want to refresh your memory when we, when we did have that hearing and we talked about the raising of the fees and prior to that we had talked about we had the wastewater um, presentation on what it was going to take, what we expected it was going to cost in order to build that, count, accounting for the money that the city owed the wastewater fund. All that was taken into account and that we had not raised fees in 19 years and that we have regular maintenance to do in addition to building a new plant. So all of those things were discussed at that time. We did bring those forward. Um, so I just want to remind you of, of that because we did and we brought out why. And if you remember, the gentleman here helping give that presentation put in numbers on the fly right here and we talked about, well, if the city were to pay back this loan today rather than amortize over the year, what difference would it make in the payments? And I think it was a, not even a dollar. I think it was just in the, in the cents. But we discussed all of that. So uh, to, to say that we haven't or that you know, we're not being responsible, that's not true because uh, we have gone through all of this. I, I think it's time for another discussion. Um, the, according to the CAFR, there's now 13, over $13 million in the wastewater fund reserve. The city owes the wastewater fund reserve, pardon me, the wastewater fund, $6.2 million. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what brief you're talking about, but the, the rate study that we had back in 2012 or 13 um, basically said we needed a $4 million reserve uh, along with keeping up on the O&M costs as well. Uh, obviously, we're now at, depending upon whether you include the city's uh, debt, uh, we're at either $13 million or $19 million reserve when it was stated very clearly we, we were looking for a $4 million reserve. Um, I think it's time for another discussion when, actual, when people actually had the facts in front of them. Thank you. Stan, I would agree in this respect. I, I would like to know how we determine that we're not going to pay back a loan. If it had been to a credit card company, I think we probably would have paid it back. Had it been to us, we're well, not. And I don't know how that determination is made. Well, the, the first loan that's being referred to is being paid back on an annual basis. That's a result of the franchise fee. The, the first loan was uh, the council had decided to pay that back over a period of time that's being paid back on an annual basis, first loan you referred to. The second loan is uh, subject to litigation right now with the Department of Finance. So three million, yeah. Okay, so I, I would like to know um, when something like that happens, if you could let the council know. I don't recall us, because in 2015, I was on the council then, and I would have liked to known that we were defaulting on a loan, and maybe legitimately so, maybe, and with good reason, but I would have liked to have known. And if I did and I missed it, it was, I'm sorry, my apologies, but I did not know we had defaulted on the loan. Okay. Would, would this item be proper discussion in our budget hearings? Pardon? I said, would, would this item discussing where we are and where we need to go be proper in our budget hearings? I know it's a separate fund than the general fund, but well, I would think it'd be appropriate uh, when we're when uh, uh, when the, when the uh, we understand where we are in terms of the litigation. 
I mean, this is still a matter of litigation. At this yeah, point. I, I, as with regard to the three million loan, that's a situation where uh, the state essentially has taken the money from us, yes. and so we're trying to get that money back right now. I can give you guys a, I can give you a status report in closed session regarding that matter, but it is a litigation matter. I, I don't think it's fair to say we're defaulting on the loan. The the problem is is that the state's not releasing the money. Well, what about the other loan? What are the terms on that one? That loan is already structured for re repayment, and we're paying. Is that the one that matured 000? last June? Pardon? Is that the loan that matured last no, year? No, no, no. The one that uh, that uh, Dr. Torres is referring to is the is three the, million is the state total. thing. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, I, I guess my feeling is the city, the city and, and the redevelopment agency were the same thing. The, the city took the money out of the wastewater fund, which is a separate, totally independent, distinct fund, to, to purchase the solar farm. Right. All right. Now, I, the, the state is irrelevant as far as I'm concerned. Obviously, it's a legal issue, but the wastewater fund was promised to have the money refunded into the wastewater fund. We are going to need that money. And as far as that goes, we're going to also need the other money. I think we need to figure out if, if, if we don't win the lawsuit, we need to have a strategy in line for how is that money going to get returned to the wastewater fund. Because it, 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 it's money that belongs to the, way, to the rate payers of the wastewater fund. It does not belong to the city or to the state or to anybody else. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Harris Brocky, I just wanted to let you know that for the people in the audience, there are some copies of the Petroglyph presentation up at the front desk if they'd like to have. Thank you, Harris. Mr. Whitnick. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, just, I got some happy news that I want to pass on to people. We, you talked about happy things during the moment of silence today. Uh, Kern County, in their effort to try and become more transparent in their Board of Supervisor meetings, etc., they've been looking for ways to try and disseminate and you, um, show the meetings of the supervisors in another way. And they've approached and we've entered into a contract with KZGN TV and Kern County to start carrying the supervisor meetings live. So we will start doing, we have the equipment being installed at this time and uh, Kern County is helping us install that equipment so we can have uh, very soon up and operating live Board of Supervisor meetings. Now we also know that they stream it as well over to the county building so people can inter have interaction with it. But the supervisors have been trying to get, just get more exposure and more transparency to their meetings to the east side of the Sierras. And I just wanted to say that uh, KZGN TV is real happy to be part of that coming up. And that, we're testing it now, and it hopefully it'll be working, hopefully, by next week. We'll try. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, Tom. Any other public comment? Yeah, my name is uh, Robert Shine. I'm back again about the uh, helicopter flights in and out of the, the hospital area. Uh, did uh, Jim Seaver, is he at the meeting tonight? Right here. All right, awesome. Uh, we, we all have a few questions for you, several of the residents here on different issues uh, so far as the helicopter pad goes. Uh, but basically, um, you, it seems like the pilots have been making a better effort about coming in and out, but yet... Uh, you know, we've gone from maybe, you know, 10 to 16 flights just in the last eight days. We've had nine flights just in eight days coming in and out. Now, uh, basically, it seems that one of the flights, along with some in the past, uh, I think we had talked about not bringing anybody in, but yet the flights come in, land, take back off, refuel, come back, land again, and pick somebody up. Um, if you're not bringing somebody in, then there's no point to come and land in the first place. So you have to be bringing something in, dropping it off, go refuel, come back, land again, and creating a situation instead of just two flights, now you have four flights. Uh, you had, I had talked to you in regards to the promise to, to use that, 
that uh, pad in, on rare occasions, and for 20-some odd years, they had done that until just in the last eight or nine months. And uh, I had talked to you about um, the, uh, the change of the hospital being critical access and that there had been no real changes. You had said that would have changed anything in that respect, but I can't understand how we went from uh, four to maybe six flights a year to up to as many as 16 flights in a month so far. And as I said, nine flights in the last eight days. Um, we've had, uh, none of us really actually want to be here. We've just been pushed to the point where we've come to the city council. Um, we understand you bought the property across from the hospital and the existing old pad is still owned by the city. And the possibility of using that pad or improving that pad to use it uh, until as such time as you mentioned to us that you're going to uh, move that emergency landing strip to a much better location instead of between the nursing home and the hospital, pinned between the houses, uh, over to uh, a new and emergency ward. Um, and you're saying, you know, like I said, three to five years. Well, three, five, how many years? How many flights are we talking in and out? Uh, basically, we'd like to see the original promise that the pad only be used on rare occasions, and that's what we originally were told, and, and as I said, you said you weren't there when that was promised, but uh, there's several of the community members here that can attest to the mailer that was sent out to us saying that, stating that, and for 20 some odd years was fine. Uh, we have talked to the FAA, and they have instructed us that they're not supposed to be flying over the houses, not supposed to be flying over at schools, which in most cases they did. They've done it uh, most of the time they flew over the school, out over the school, out over the houses, and made that the regular path. I understand when the tower was created, that narrowed the path and basically forced it back toward the houses even more so. Um, but basically, um, since we've talked to the FAA, the pilots have been doing a better job because we've talked directly to Mercy Air and, uh, you know, why couldn't have that have been done originally? Why does it have to become a fight over this whole thing? Um, but the possibility of using that old pad or uh, at a helipad can actually have a bar painted across it, redesignated the direction, the preferred direction to go out. Um, if you can answer some of those questions, that would be fantastic. And I'd like one of other community members here to... Uh, talk to you about what the FAA had to say to her. And uh, I would also like, there's a couple of, uh, and not to be biased, a couple of flights uh, on some video I'd like to use your multimedia to play, and up, up to and including one of the better flights where they take off and land. Is that possible? We haven't, we ha don't have this item on our agenda to do that, and we don't have it set up. If you want to ask for something to be put on the agenda and talk to our staff, that's certainly something you can do. Okay, so you're saying at this time we can't do Absolutely that not. Sorry. It's All not right. on the agenda that way. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Elizabeth Freire, and um, I spoke about a month ago, and since that time I uh, we had another close encounter, I had a close encounter where the helicopter came in about two weeks ago and I did some measuring the next morning and it was a, less than 40 feet from the back of my house. And so that's when I contacted the FAA. I was able to get the flight number and um, they're very interested. I have a point person to deal with and um, they um, he assured me that they are listening to our concerns and um, since that time we've observed that some of the helicopter pilots are getting in and out of there very quietly, if you can say that, and going between the hospital and the hotel, but the, they t the gentleman I spoke to at the FAA told me they're not to go over the high school. They're and they're supposed to, well, I asked them, please just stay 100 feet away from my house. That's all I'm asking, because that's, you know, and uh, he said they're looking into it and that 
um, just keep sending the videos as necessary, but I will admit there has been some improvement. The frequency is question, you know, something I have questions about, but Mr. Severa is here tonight, so maybe we'll get some answers. So that's just what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jay Winkle, and I'm just um, repeating what I um, I've told last time. I don't know if he's able to see the video of my family being um, prop wash coming down and throwing all the sand and blasting us when we're outside in the patio and having the kids running, being scared of um, of the way the improper flying of the the pilots disrespecting us and the safety of us enjoying our home and sitting outside it just you would think that they would be more professional in the way that they their mannerisms on how they're flying in and taking off because there is some that are doing it great and it's really nice to see those pilots do, performing it properly and not doing it the way that I'm seeing it lately coming in just uh, just disrespect just, just, just coming in like that and real low and just blasting over us and I know that they've been just recently just the last couple of days have put down some gravel and stuff back there to control some of the sand, which is, which is going to be a big help. So, I just wanted to repeat that and let you guys know that. Please do what you can to help us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Suver. Anyway, uh, Jim Suver, and I'm glad that the uh, pilots are doing a better job, and we certainly want to enforce that to Mercy. Just as a point of information, I don't control Mercy. It's a county contract, and they're not the only ones that fly. Uh, they've always been very responsive as long as I've been here when we've had a complaint, so that's not really a recent thing. Um, and I do see the email trails when they do talk uh, to Mr. Shine and other people in the neighborhood. And in fact, the feedback we got from the FAA, they were pleased that Mercy was actually um, trying to deal with the situation. So I'm here to talk about the other side of the discussion, and frankly, what I hope is the most important side, and that is saving lives. Our helipad isn't used by hobbyists. If a helicopter comes in, it's to save someone's life. I went back and looked at data from 2014 through 2015. We averaged between nine flights to 19 a month for the last two years. And in fact, we used air transport 19 flights less in 2015 than we did in 2014 for a total of 169 flights. And I've gone back a little bit further, and that's been fairly constant, at least within my span here. I certainly can't speak uh, prior to 2009. So during 2015, these flights saved 19 pediatric patients, 45 patients in cardiac distress, 12 surgical patients, 7 patients in renal distress, 7 patients with severe respiratory problems, 5 motor vehicle accidents, 34 patients with strokes, 8 mothers, and 9 newborns. We don't need to second guess medical judgment of our physicians when patients need to be transferred for services that are only available at tertiary hospitals, not a community hospital. The bulk of our transfers we do, 81%, are done by ground, not by helicopter. We only use air transport for higher levels of care with transfers to tertiary facility. The change in designation in Medicare has nothing to do with increase in air flights. Um, we would not use helicopters to do any sort of transfer uh, laterally. Um, I did do some research because I am concerned about the neighbors behind us. 60% of our flights occurred between 0600 to 2200. Uh, unfortunately, I can't always control when patient safety occurs and we need to transfer some. So, but the 60% are occurring from 6 to uh, uh, 10 o'clock at night. They also use the helipad for major accidents, which the ambulance meets the helicopter directly and bypasses us, saves precious time by not going to the hospital. That occurred four times in 2015 and 10 times in 2014. The heliport is a valuable and necessary tool for our first responders, such as the fire and ambulance crews. In addition, we also get Navy flights with an injured tourist or base personnel. I might also use our helipad. The other issue that we have and why it maybe has changed over the last 20 years is current patient treatment protocols that are set nationally for stroke and heart attack have minute limits, those golden minutes. Every minute counts. And so if we have stabilized a patient, we need to get them to a tertiary facility with an appropriate subspecialist within those minutes, or you have bad outcomes. So that has changed over the last five years, and in fact, Kern County has adopted many of those regulations 
for their EMS protocols, which the hospital does not control. They are countywide about when we use a bird, when they bypass the hospital, when they stabilize the treat. So some of that is done by uh, counties. But remember, minutes in our business now count between when we can administer a blood uh, clotting agent and when we can't. So I think I'm glad to hear Mercy has been responsive, and we expect them to be responsive for that. Um, I do see where they have talked to their pilots about their choice in flight paths, and that incident with you and your children the barbecue shouldn't happen, if indeed it happened. And I've seen appropriate discipline to their pilots when they have done that. Um, there are other people other than Mercy, however, that's uh, um, something I will continue to work on. Um, we are, we are spending $28,000 to add a coating to some of the land that borders Mesquite um, as a sign of uh, good faith uh, to do that. I did stop a physician from landing on our helipad that wasn't doing anything in town because I saw him 10 feet above the houses and heritage, and I told him you couldn't land here anymore. Uh, so I, I have been trying to be responsive to that. So in talking about the future, our neuro emergency room uh, department, a brand new building, uh, it does include a new helipad that's lo located closer to China Lake Boulevard. I want to let the council know helipads cost a million dollars to build and bring up to spec. And I can only incur that expense once, and I need to make sure when I place it, I place it right and also make it sure that it's in logically located to where the emergency room is. Um, we um, estimate, in answer to Mr. Uh, Shine's question, that the ER is a five-year project. Uh, if I can make one plug, three years of that is because of excess state regulations and is blueprint review. It probably will take me a year to build the building, but um, we have to have it approved by the state. Uh, we have explored moving the helipad to the roof of the new building, and if we are building a 10-story hospital, that works out really well. Unfortunately, we do not have the funds for a 10-story hospital, and on a one-story hospital, it would appear the vibrations would be rattling and rolling the building, which is probably not the environment we want for a new ER. Um, however, the new helipad will be located um, bordering China Lake Boulevard, away uh, from the back. Uh, most likely, I'm looking at a raised structure with parking underneath, so it's even higher. I think this is the right way, and we actually do have a heli um, port expert uh, working um, with us on that to make sure that we get it and if there's any way that additional noise buffering could be done. But the helipad will be moved, but it will be five years, and that's a financial consideration as well as a state licensing regulation. Um, I do know enough of the history. I talked to a couple people at Heritage. So the old helipad um, that was last used in the 1990s um, was moved apparently because ambulances were used to move patients from that helipad to the hospital, and then the ambulance company was billing folks. Uh, sometimes as much as $4,000. And apparently that is what prompted the move to the back so we didn't need to have the ambulance. I would tell you now, uh, at one time I thought about activating that old helipad. Um, going back to my earlier comment that minutes count for us to land a helicopter there, ambulance them, unload them twice is detrimental to patient care. The other thing is that helipad no longer meets standards. I actually uh, tried to pursue that as well, and then the other reality of trying to cross China Lake Boulevard. I'll make one more plug. Thank you, Caltrans, for the wonderful median. Um, is, is just, it's just not going to uh, be able to occur. But we did research that to see if that could happen, and that's not a viable option. Um, I can tell you one story and why the helipad is important is we had a person brought in the ER that shared with me her husband's story. She realized he had been down for an hour. They ambulanced him to the hospital. We gave him the clot busting drug in consultation with our stroke uh, referral. They had a bird land immediately. We saved this man so he can now talk and walk. And that's why um, we're pretty serious about being able to get people out. And I'm very sensitive to the needs of the neighbors, and I will continue to put pressure on Mercy, knowing, of course, they don't work for me. It is a county contract. Um, I have found out of, uh, I've been doing this for 30 years, they have been pretty responsive, and I have after my first conversation, Mr. Shine, I made it very clear. They are also willing to come to the city council meeting, and they also indicated to me they're more than happy to meet uh, with the uh, homeowners behind us. They've been that responsive. There may be a couple other helicopter companies that have landed, and I will talk to them in the same tone. Again, I can't control flight patterns, and I guess the last thing I would leave you with is, to some degree, I have to defer to trained helicopter pilots about landing approach. 
Um, I am not a pilot, and uh, I really have to let them make the right decision, hopefully showing respect to the neighbors, as they indicated, uh, to do that. But we're not doing any more helicopter transports than we have in, in previous years, at least within my uh, experience. And as I told you, uh, the practice of medicine has changed, and we get sick babies to Loma Linda where they have a neonatologist and can save them. We get stroke victims to somewhere with a vascular surgeon, so if the clot bedding agent doesn't work, they can go in with a hook and pull the clot out. Uh, same thing with people that have a heart attack. We need to get them to a hospital with a cath lab. And the answer is not for us to add all these services because we don't have the volume to do that. And the better standard of care is to get them to a tertiary facility. So I, I did want to preface that I really don't want to get in a debate um, over this because it's also a public comment section. I'm more than happy to meet with Mercy and the neighbors. And I want you to keep giving them feedback. And you can send me an email as well when they don't behave. Um, because there's no reason for them to be right over your house. And that's why I banned the other uh, helicopter operator, uh, the physician, from landing on a helipad. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't want this to be a debate either, and you have had your time. I don't want to say that you can't speak, no, but we, I would appreciate it if, pardon me? You said we could have a question no, this isn't the appropriate time to do that. The question time is to talk to him. You've, we've heard you. We've listened to your responses. And uh, we've heard and listened to your questions, and we've heard Mr. Suver and his responses. I'd appreciate it if you have concerns, follow his recommendation. Talk to them. Talk to have a meeting among yourselves, because quite frankly, most of that is not something we have any control over. So we really would like you to do that. If after that, come back and talk to me if you haven't received what you want. Okay. All right. Well, that's why we're here. Thank you. Okay. Okay, well, this is your opportunity to do so with him at another time with Mercy and whoever. But I do appreciate it, and I thank you all for coming and talking. Okay, next public comment. Good evening, colleagues. Uh, Eric Bruin, 208 Barber Avenue. I have a letter that I emailed you guys, and I'll go ahead and uh, hand these for distribution. I uh, emailed this letter to each of the council members and to the RACVB this, this morning. Um, I'm up here to speak just for a moment about some trends and something that I noticed, especially regarding strategy. Um, I just returned from Washington, D.C. after six days. I was there on a political conference for my business, and during the course of that, I obviously spend time talking about the community I love with our congressman and with his staff. And at the same time, we've seen over the last month the issue of the jail, broadband. We heard airport in the last week. And a conversation began that I felt should be put down on paper. And it's a conversation about the term strategy. Strategy is obviously for every business or for organization how it chooses to accomplish its goals. It lays out the blueprint for achieving what it hopes to do for the organization or the business it represents. In 2012, after what we would call a 24-month muck-up of trash, we came forward with Measure L. And at that time, we put forward an idea of public trust in that we would protect public safety and infrastructure improvement in roads. And largely, the discussion became a, how do we properly divide these two important resources equally? And we set up a steering committee to oversee that. We had debate inside this session. And we have largely, for the last three years, followed that model in terms of our needs for infrastructure and, and uh, public safety. This November, that measure, or a form of a measure, will return to the ballots for our citizenry, and I believe that the jail and things like AB 109 and Prop 47 have changed the game. And I'm encouraging the council to reevaluate its strategy. And what that encouragement is that while roads remain an important aspect of our community and an improvement in our community, I believe that the term, we have a duty to public trust and protecting both segments 
is no longer truly relevant. This measure, whatever is presented in November, will be about public safety. This community will be forced with a decision to choose to pass the measure or choose to lose half of its police force. That's the reality. Nobody wants to say it, nobody wants to play hardball, but I'm asking you to take a moment and think about it truly and boldly that the strategy is no longer about infrastructure alone. It is truly about public safety. But more importantly, I think we have allowed our community to do something as a result of this need for public trust and safety over roads and roads and public safety is that we have chosen to diminish what we consider our values for quality of life and for economic development. The issues that I presented are all things that have came up over the last 30 days that provide significant important traits to a growing community. Broadband is not an option. It is a utility and a mandate. It is the same as when, when Thomas Edison invented the telephone pole, a community deciding not to put up telephone lines. It is that important. The airport, while I agree that it is not the city's responsibility to come up with some money to help match it, what a statement it would make to our community if the city did say, we are willing to help commit to getting this accomplished for our community. And then finally, of course, the jail. We all agree, and 700 citizens came in here and agreed, that this is not a joke. This is about protecting our homes, our children, and our community that we love. And what I'm asking you to do is to take a moment and set aside the idea that a few voices and a few needs for infrastructure are all that must be considered in this measure. Strategy must change the measure's mentality. I understand that the community had distrust over general funds usage. And I grant that after trash, they had a lot of rights for that. But you know what, that's changed. You have earned the public's trust in what you've done in the infrastructure. You have earned the public's trust in what you've done for public safety. But I don't know that we have earned the respect that we need to do for our quality of life for our community. We continue to say, well, the base could do this or the base could do that. We need to erase that from our mindset. I understand I'm out of time and I apologize. I simply ask that you take a moment, read my comments. I am nothing more than a private citizen asking you to take a moment and make sure that the strategy behind whatever measure you put forward truly encompasses all areas of necessity within our community, especially quality of life and economic development. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Any other public comment? Okay, seeing there's no other public comment, any other council comments? Okay, then we will uh, go to the consent count, oh, council announcements. Sorry, any council announcements? I, I'll just make a couple quick ones, really, really quickly. Um, just a reminder that the PAC dinner honoring um, all those who volunteer all of their time and resources um, is this Saturday, the 5th of March. Um, and our Blue Jacket Awards honoring all those enlisted um, is March 19th. That's it. Okay. Um, I have none. So, Jim, did you have any you wanted to make an announcement on? Um, no, ma'am. Madam Mayor, I didn't make anything. Okay. Then we're going to go to the consent calendar. All items on the consent calendar are considered to be routine by city staff and will be approved in one motion if no member of the council or the public wishes to comment or ask questions. If comment or discussion is desired by anyone, that item will be removed from the consent calendar and will be considered separately with public comment before action is taken. Item number four, adopt resolution approving compensation plans for mid-management and confidential unrepresented groups of employees. Item number five, adopt a resolution for change order number one to the professional services agreement in the amount of $38,542 with the engineer of record, Wilden Engineering for additional design right of way and easement acquisition services on the down street widening project and authorize the city manager, Dennis Fear to execute change order number one. Number six. 
adopt a resolution to approve the professional services agreement with the firm Wildan Engineering to provide construction management in the amount of $51,635 for the installation of a traffic signal at the intersection of Channel Lake Boulevard and Bowman Road and authorize the city manager, Dennis Spear, to sign the agreement. Number seven, adopt a resolution of the city of Ridgecrest of the city, uh, city of Ridgecrest, city, okay. Adopt a resolution of the city council, the city of Ridgecrest, approving the 2016 city of Ridgecrest federal drug and alcohol testing policies and guidelines and rescinding resolution number 1268. Number eight, adopt a resolution of the city of Ridgecrest authorizing some middle of application for payment programs and related authorizations. Number nine, adopt a resolution approving a contract change order number two for the amount of $9,016 with the contractor JTS construction for the Kermagee restroom concession project and authorize the city manager Dennis Spear to, to sign change order number two. Number 10, adopt a resolution of the city council of the city of Ridgecrest approving the purchase and installation of sliding entrance doors and the electrical work required for the new electrical doors at Penny Pool in the amount of $9,558 with a contractor of American Automatic Doors Incorporated and Trip Electric and authorize the city manager Dennis Spear to sign authorized park impact fees to be used for this project. Number 11, approve draft minutes of the city council city successor agency redevelopment agency Financing Authority, Housing Authority minutes dated February 17th, 2016. Council, any items you wish pulled? No. Number eight. Number eight, okay. Lori? Okay, now, then is there any items wishing to be pulled by the, st by, um, the public, please? Eight and ten. Any others? Okay, we'll adopt a motion approving uh, items number four, five, six, seven, and nine and eleven. So move. Second. Councilmember Mauer. Aye. Councilmember Thomas. Aye. Mayor Breeden. Aye. Vice Mayor Acton. Aye. Mayor Pro Tim Sanders. I'll approve. Okay, so item number eight would be the first one. Councilman Sanders, could I answer your question, sir, or concern? Yeah, thank you. Um, mostly I'm just trying to understand what this is. Is this a, a mandate that's coming down and they're now providing some funding for it? Are we somehow, are there strings attached to this funding, basically, is the question I want to answer. Yeah, Mr. Sanders, this is an uh, ongoing program. It's happened several years. The city um, can make application or receive, provided we uh, do the documentation, have the resolution that we're asking for, uh, funds from uh, CalRecycle for the basis of uh, promoting the CRV, beverage container recycling. Uh, last year, we received about $7,808. We used this money primarily for container purchases for recycled containers, both in the city and, and uh, at city location as well as uh, in the general public. We did uh, some containers for uh, a variety of parks and, uh, and actually did, I think, a couple of them for, for uh, uh, a couple of the business streets. So that's what this is actually about. It's an ongoing program that's offered through Recycle to allow us to get funds to uh, help the program and on specifically on CRV uh, beverage containers. So this is for purchasing new recycling containers, collection containers? There's a variety of things that we can do with the funds. Uh, one of the possibilities we're considering this year would be um, uh, if we can uh, make it work and, and it is a t uh, the, the nexus is a little bit difficult, but for example, we could uh, potentially f uh, utilize part of these funds to uh, look at funding a ridge project for a cleanup area if we find some, particularly if we have an area that we can show that there's beverage containers that meet the CRV, CVR uh, issue, 
as an example. We have, we have some limitations, restrictions on the kinds of stuff we can use this money for, but uh, in past we bought recycled containers. Okay, do you have plans for this year on what, what we want to do besides the, the possible cleanup? Um, no, because honestly, until we make the submission and do the calculations, we don't know how much money they're actually going to give us. So once, oh, we, did, once we know that number, because I do a calculation on a basis of per capita, and they have you know, their strange uh, formula system, and they come up and tell us you get this amount of money this year, we'll be able then to determine with that amount of money what we can actually use it for in terms of types of projects. But those are some of the things we're lo we've done in the past and things we're looking at doing in the future. And certainly we'd be interested, I mean, staff would be interested in, you know, if there's an interest on council's part to get involved in this discussion on how we actually use this funds, but it's been so small we haven't, and they were restricted so hard, we haven't, uh, we haven't done that, honestly, historically in the past. Are we uh, in any way uh, making any commitments to do anything or to comply with things by accepting this money? Well, if, if we utilize the funds, get the funds in and utilize them, there is an auditing procedure we have to provide the, the state and we have to identify how the funds were used and provide documentation to establish it. Just like anything else we get from the, uh, the state or related, there's always uh, uh, strings and attachments that go with it. Uh, but it's primarily an administrative burden just to get the, um, the regulations required. If, in fact, we did not use the funds, uh, we would have to uh, technically either we have the option of carrying them over. I forget right now, sir, exactly the number of years we can carry it over, whether it's one or two. Um, and um, then we would have to return it back to the recycling uh, system or back to the state. But so again, it's such a small amount of funding. Right. Is, is it worth the administrative burden to, to accept it? To be very honest with you, the staff has uh, discussed that a couple of times. At this point, we have determined we'll try it again this year and because the regulatory requirements are growing from the state, but they are not to the point where we don't believe that uh, we can't uh, maintain them or provide them. Um, <clears throat> and we certainly are not, a, we certainly do not like to turn down grant money if we can get it. Um, um, so uh, at this point, we, it is certainly in the, in the discussion as, as the state increases its requirements in terms of auditing and, uh, and or supplying accounting and backup information. At some point, it may not be technically a um, you know, thing we might want to accept. But right now, at least this year, we're intending to make the application, get the funds, or get the, uh, the level of funding, and then determine whether or not um, <clears throat> we, how we want to use them. And then obviously, that relates to what kind of regulatory backup we'll have to provide in terms of receipts, documentation, contracts, and so on. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other council comments? Public comments. Okay, um, I'll entertain a motion to I, approve item number eight. I move approval of item eight. Second. Council Member Mauer. Aye. Council Member Thomas. Aye. Mayor Breeden. Aye. Vice Mayor Acton. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Sanders. Aye. All approve. Okay, number 10. Yes, I pulled this, Dave Matthews. Um, I was just curious, are these the same kind of doors that we have out in the front main entrance for City Hall? Yes, sir. Why are they being installed on the Penny Pool complex? Because the doors that are currently at Penny Pool are the original doors, and over the years with the increased use and just normal wear and tear, they're, they're pretty much completely destroyed. Would not just an ordinary door do? Or is this, is this part of the ADA? And if so, where's the money coming from? That's answer your first question. Sure, we could put normal doors back in there, probably some sort of retrofitted normal doors. Um, because uh, we won't be able to find those types of doors anymore. But the idea behind the, the, the new doors and the sliding doors is making it more accessible for ADA, you know, ADA uh, individuals. And the money's coming from uh, uh, parks impact fees. And, and where? Park impact fees. Park impact, oh, for, you mean developers? 
No, impact fees. Those are the fees that are attached when homes are built uh, to offset the impact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, the reason I st thought about bringing this up is because I know the last I heard, and that's been quite a while, by the way, uh, there's, there's other problems over at Penny Pool that we could be spending money on if we so desired or had it. And I just wondered how this, you say the wear and tear is that bad that it, they really need to be re replaced. Yeah, the, the, the issues you're probably talking about at Penny Pool are, are um, issues that, for one, we don't have nearly enough money, to, and a lot of them we couldn't use impact fee money for anyway. Um, and we definitely don't have money in the general fund budget right now, so it would take, you know, some sort of a grant um, that we're always pursuing or something like that. But, the, yes, you're right. There are issues at the pool that need to be addressed at some point. Um, but currently in the budget, those aren't, aren't included, and we can't, you know, to make a long story short, once we start going down that road, you have to fix them all yeah. uh, because of, because of change, changes in the ADA compliance and the code compliance. So... Like I said, once you open that can of worms, you got to do it all, and and the the funding is in, you know, more than our ability right now. All right, thank you, sir. Any other comments? Any other public comments? Entertain a motion to approve number ten. So moved. Second. Council Member Mauer. Aye. Council Member Thomas. Aye. Mayor Breeden. Aye. Vice Mayor Acton. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Sanders. Aye. All approved. Okay. The next item is a public hearing and resolution of the city Ridge, of the city Ridgecrest City Council establishing a finding for unmet trans, transit needs that are reasonable to meet with a public transportation system. Mr. Spear. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council, this item is a request for the council to conduct an unmet needs public hearing. The purpose of the hearing is to provide an opportunity for the public to comment on perceived unmet transit needs. The intent of the hearing is for the council to receive public comments, discuss the comments, determine if there are any unmet transit needs that are reasonable to meet. In terms of a summary, the Transportation Development Act of 1971 requires that eligible uh, claimants review their transit needs annually through the public hearing process. The documentation of the public comments and the discussion, as well as the determination of the council, will be provided to the current Council of Governments. And in its capacity as an RTPA or MPO, uh, review, they review the materials for TDA compliance and they distribute funds for various transportation uses, uses to eligible agencies. In terms of guidelines, the current Council of Governments Resolution 9004 adopts the definition of unmet needs and that are reasonable to me. And repeating those, uh, an unmet need, well, first of all, the current Council of Government by Resolution 9004 has defined an unmet need reasonable to me as follows. Unmet need. An unmet transit need exists if an individual of any age or physical condition is unable to transport himself or herself due to deficiencies in the existing transportation system. Exclu excluded are those requests for minor operational improvements and those improvements funded and scheduled for implementation in the following fiscal year. Reasonable to me. A, operational feasibility. The requested improvement must be safe to operate and there must be adequate roadways for transit vehicles. B, duplication of services. The proposed service shall not duplicate other transit services. Timing. The proposed service shall be in response to an existing rather than a future need. D, service must meet legally, uh, service must meet the legally required fare box ratio. Uh, based on the Public Utilities Code Section 992682, 992685, and uh, Sections 6633.2 and 6633.5 of the California Code. Uh, with fares uh, close to the fare, or uh, with fares close to the fare of similar service. 
and the uh, before and the recommendation would be for the council now to conduct a public hearing, receive comments, discuss and determine whether there are any unmet uh, transit needs. But before you actually open up the hearing, I wanted to introduce uh, Bob Snotty, current council of governments. Uh, he's here tonight uh, to uh, uh, to pay us a visit and uh, uh, and actually witness the unmet uh, needs hearing process and available for any questions uh, pertaining to transit or this particular hearing that the council may have. Would you like to say something before we um, open the, the uh, public comment or the public hearing, sorry? First of all, um, my name is Bob Sonny from Current Council of Governments. How about now? Bob Sonny from Kern Council of Governments, and it's always a pleasure to come out to our member agencies. I get this uh, once a year to, um, in fact, uh, this March I'll probably be at 10 of the 12 agencies that uh, receive Transportation Development Act funding in Kern County. I love coming out at least once or twice a year just to see what's going on in your community. Uh, I'm not here except for just uh, witness the unmet transit needs and provide any technical assistance that you need. Uh, I'm the person that receives your t uh, transportation development claims and processes them through the uh, uh, TTAC and to, through our Kerncog board for approval, and then I send the money back out to you. So that's my purpose for being here tonight. Sending money. Hooray. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm going to uh, open the public hearing for comments. Is there any council comments? Public comments. Dave Matthews' address is on file. That time of year again, isn't it? I don't know how many of these I've spoken at, uh, but anything that seems to be unmet hardly ever gets <coughs> implemented. I am not a writer of the system right, we have in place right now, but I do observe some of the writers particularly when I go to the grocery store. Around the first of the month, mostly, there's a lot of people that utilize those buses to go get their monthly groceries or whatever, their weekly groceries. And they, of course, are limited to the five days that the system is operating. Well, what if they're paid or their welfare checks or whatever they're living on don't come until the Friday and they can't get out there. There's no transportation then until the following Monday. There has always been a need for some transportation on the weekends and we have never had any. And I can understand why uh, the need probably is not that great, but there is some. So the cost maybe of implementing it may be prohibitive. But just starting to think about this a little bit before it came up here, I was wondering about something. Could that system enter into a contract of some kind with some of the taxi companies to provide like a dial ride on the weekends and be reimbursed for some of it or part all of it. Maybe that would help out on some of these weekends because there are facilities that are open on the weekend like the medical, the uh, uh, urgent care uh, at the uh, Rural Health, uh, over by the Rural, Rural Health Clinic. And also there are some doctors who actually have office hours on the weekends, or on Saturdays at least. I don't know of anybody that does it on Mondays, or Sundays, I mean. So I'm pointing out what I consider a not meant need, and uh, I'm just wondering if this may be a possible solution to helping solve it. Thank you.
Stan or Tora. I would like to second uh, the comments just made by Dave. Um, on more than one other occasion, I've stood up here and suggested a voucher system with the taxis. Uh, certainly on the weekends, that would, that would be one thing that would be uh, possible. Also, my understanding is that the current system that we have and pay for is only used certain hours of the day, uh, and rather than keeping it open or, or, or working when there's no ridership, it might be cheaper for the city to work with the taxis. It seems like I see more taxis all the time with different colors of paint. I don't know how many taxi services there are in town, uh, but it certainly would seem like uh, if there's a way of complementing or supplementing our, um, our system, uh, especially if it would be more convenient for the riders and cheaper for the city, it's something that we should definitely look into. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other public comment? Any other council comment? Lori? Um, I had the same question about the Saturdays, and I'm pretty sure we've discussed this in the past, but for the life of me, I've not been able to remember the answer. Um, we have two taxi companies in town, by the way, Ridgecrest Taxi and IWV, which brings me to the second question I have on this, which is I am a subcontractor, independent contractor, for a Ridgecrest Medical Transportation, which is part of Ridgecrest Taxi. If this goes into a discussion, do I need to recuse myself? No, it's just a public hearing. I just want to make sure that that's out there so there's no issue. Yeah, we're oh, yeah, gonna, there is. yeah. It'd be better if you recused yourself. Dennis, can, can you answer any of these questions that were asked? Um, is that something we just send on as an unmet need? Well, we, we, we uh, forward the, uh, the comments in the discussion as, a, uh, as an unmet need to uh, current council of government. With, uh, with the dollars that I know that we s spend on uh, and that are given to us because of our location, we can have less number of people riding it and still make it profitable or at least well, not losing money. Could you address that? Y or yes, that well, something? it's the fare box ratio. And uh, as a rural operator, we're required to make 10% of the fare box. In other words, the actual paying customer customers need to uh, pay a uh, minimum of 10% of the cost of actually operating the service for us to run it. Uh, the, uh, uh, and I, and, but I just wanted to, I'm trying to answer two questions at once here, but uh, there was, uh, first of all, uh, uh, Mr. Matthews uh, properly pointed out uh, the fact that to make the fare box, it, uh, it is, it's usually uh, considered a luxury to operate a, uh, a weekend service because rural operators often have a hard time even making a 10% on the five-day week. But then second of all, uh, uh, going back to why we're where we're at, we used to have a dollar ride service. We had a dollar ride service, I think, about seven years ago. And what it was, it was inefficient. It actually was making somewhere between even maybe less than 5% at times. Bob probably has a longer history on that than I do even. And uh, what, uh, what uh, as a result of that, uh, the uh, a uh, current council of governments paid for a, um, a consultant to actually study our system, make recommendations, and they developed what took us about two or three years to actually uh, implement. But was the, they 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 felt that the best system for our particular city was a dollar, was a, a flex route, a deviated flex route, and what that allows is it allows for this it complements and allows for uh, previously. <coughs> Uh, folks that were dollar ride that uh, were ADA uh, yeah, handicapped to for us to we run a route, but within that route, and I believe that we either have uh, allow for one or two pickups per uh, for one uh, one loop uh, to be able to go off route, go to the person's house, pick them up, come back on route, and continue with our with our route service. So in other words, we pick up, but instead of going directly to a person's house and then take them to where they want to go. We pick them up and we take them to where they want to go, but we take them uh, where they want to go uh, as part of 
uh, the route uh, that, that we're running. So th that was a uh, design that was come up, that um, was developed by a uh, consultant. It took us two or three years to implement. I think we're still maybe in kind of a probation on that because we're we're expanding. But uh, uh, but that's yeah, why we're why we're where we're at. I'd like to speak to uh, a couple of issues. Weekend service is always requested throughout Kern County. It is the hardest service to provide for a public transit operator. Usually it's difficult to find people in the first place that want to work Saturdays and Sundays regularly. And second, it's a very high premium cost for employees and very low yield result in passenger ridership. And yes, uh, I've got 30 years experience in this and I came from Delano for 14 years. I, I was the transit supervisor had to go to my board and say we just can't afford to do Sundays anymore. It's killing us on the fare box return. Unfortunately, this the rule that set up tr public transit is 1972, uh, or uh, actually 1974. It goes way back there. The rules haven't changed since then. Uh, a rural transit operator has to get a 10% return from the passenger ridership exclusively. So 90% of the uh, uh, rest of the cost for the agency is borne by the taxpayers and the agency. But you have to get at least 10%. And generally speaking, the, the volume on Saturdays and Sundays, uh, in Delano it was certainly moms where dad was out in the field working and moms going to the, uh, sh uh, either going to shopping or going to uh, laundry, those type of service, you know, critical services that they couldn't get because the other car was out in the fields working with dad. So I understand the, the problems that small communities have. In fact, uh, there's only one or two small rural operators that can afford a Saturday and Sunday operation. Most of the McFarland and, and uh, Taft, they're shutting down on, on weekends. We do allow, or actually TDA allows you to try that uh, a Saturday service and you get 90 days, or actually it's a three months exemption from the fare box requirement. But just about every place that's been tried in Kern County, they try for 90 days and it just doesn't meet the fare box uh, requirement to cover the expenses of operating on Saturdays and Sundays. And another competition, you mentioned you have two taxi services in town, correct? It probably hasn't hit Ridgecrest, but it might be out here. Uber and Lyft also offer alternative transportation needs and that's a local thing that may be popping up, may not be popping up. I don't know if it's gotten out here at Ridgecrest. But certainly it's in Bakersfield, and, and I've even heard it in Delano uh, that there's Uber uh, drivers where they, you know, private citizens contract with Uber, and they pick up people when they want to, and they get paid to do it, and then they, you know, operate at, at different services. So uh, that's just a budget analysis every year that we get to this place. Is can, uh, yes, there's always going to be a demand for Saturday and Sunday service, but can a smaller rural operator afford to do it? And by the way, you brought up the, uh, the service here. You have the only uh, service type in Kern County that does it, and it maximizes the efficiency cost of operating a rural transit operator. You get the best fixed rate cost of over, uh, having a fixed route uh, system that operates in peak demand time, which gets you your maximum bang for your buck for your service. And then in the slow demand uh, times, it functions as a demand response of where it can go off a fixed route and it becomes more passenger friendly, curb to curb service. It can't get more efficient than that. Uh, I mean, that, and it, it took us about a year or so to figure that out, but uh, you guys have done a wonderful job. Uh, that type of service is the most efficient way you can operate a public uh, rural transit. I mean, uh, Taft is, uh, in, has a fixed route and a demand response, and they're struggling to make their fare box. Now, I have a question on um, if we were to do this vouchers on Saturday for taxis, the person getting the taxi, they'd have to pay 10% of the fare, whatever that is, right? Yes, if you're using Transportation Development Act funds, you still have to have the efficiency of getting a 10% fare box return on it. So buying vouchers for a taxi would have to be under the constraints of the TDA regulations. Do we make our 10%? You do. Thank you. Okay. 
And I might add that uh, it, this is a, uh, it's not just Kern County, uh, even Golden Empire Transit, our biggest transit operator, they have six to seven million people riding every year. They are struggling to meet their urbanized fare box, which is 20%. So they look at their books every, uh, every month to make sure they're making their 20%, uh, and that's an urbanized fare box. But this, is a, a, this isn't just unique to Kern County. Uh, recent publications in Los Angeles County and uh, Santa Monica and Orange County, they are way behind their normal fare box return. In the urbanized areas, that's 20%, and they're falling into 13 and 14% categories. So it's, it's not just Kern County, it's, it's all over the place. Okay, is there any other public comment? Dan Rotoro, it, it seems to me that I, I'm not exactly sure what I heard with regard to the voucher. It, it, it sounded like if the, 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 the people were willing to pay 10% of the fare that it was, was doable. I mean, it may be we could offer an 80% voucher rather than a 10%, uh, a um, pardon me, rather than a 90% voucher. We, it might actually be cheaper I, I, until somebody actually takes out a piece of paper and, and writes down, you know, what are the fares and are the taxis willing to absorb it and maybe give a 10 percent or a 20 percent break uh, on their fares so that it just seems to me that until we actually look at it and spend a little bit of energy to figure out what is best, we may, we may actually be doing our citizens a disservice by not putting through some type of a voucher system. And, and I would ask that we actually put, put out a little money, if we have to, to do a study to see would it be feasible to use a voucher system? Because in the long run, it might be better for the city from a cost standpoint and better for the residents. Thank you. Stan, are you saying in lieu of the service that's already provided, everything would be a voucher system, or oh, is that well, an addition for, to? I mean, if, no, I, I, I wouldn't suggest that we allow just anybody to use a voucher, but, but anybody who is currently using the, the current transit system, and, and I don't know how you, I mean, I honestly don't know how you would select who could and who couldn't use it. Um, but it, but it seems to me that it, right now the ridership is very limited. Uh, there aren't many people using it, and that's why, it, it, you know, we can't pay. You know, we're having a hard time with the the the, the uh, getting our ten percent. Um, so I mean, obviously there are issues that need to be addressed, and and I wouldn't suggest that somebody like I be allowed to use a taxi and have have the city pay ninety percent of the fare. Uh, that's not what I'm saying, but for the people who need uh, to, to, to be able to go to see a doctor or to go shopping or to the laundromat or whatever, uh, okay. people who actually need public transportation, and my feeling is it's probably not that many in our town that a voucher system might be uh, beneficial to the city in terms of overall costs and be a whole lot more convenient for the ridership. And, and until we actually look at it, we're not going to know. Thank you. So if we used a voucher system, let's just use the hypothetical one, if that was determined to be uh, able to be done in this area, Everybody in the town would be eligible for eligible. it. Eligible. And the 90 percent would anybody. be picked up by your transportation funds? I'd have to research that. I don't know of any voucher system to a taxi company that's been used by uh, transit uh, funds. Generally speaking, if there's other transportation modes available, uh, usually those modes are chosen. Uh, and it okay. would be difficult to set up a voucher system, would you come in Monday uh, through Friday to get it at uh, City Hall to pick up the voucher and say, I need to get a ride from my doctor's house over to the market, over to the, 
I don't know how you would yeah. regulate that from the city side because it, you couldn't restrict anybody from using it. Once you have, once they sit in a public uh, vehicle, anybody mm -hmm. can use it, rich, poor, whatever. And you okay. wouldn't have to prove need. <laughs> okay, I just replaced my car. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm being facetious. Please, everybody. Um, okay, any other public comment? Any other council comment? Okay, then I would uh, declare um, any staff comment. Um, comments have already been made. Okay, then let's close this public hearing. And a motion to approve the resolution. Do we need a motion to approve the resolution? It says there. You, and my directions, you have a motion to approve yes, resolution. resolution. I need a motion to approve. Okay, I'll make the motion to approve. Second. Council Member Maurer? Aye. Council Member Thomas? No. Mayor Breeden? Aye. One recused. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sanders? Aye. Three in favor, one in, against, one recused. Okay, the next item is discussion of the grand jury. Uh, final report concerning the city of Ridgecrest and the Joint Powers Authority. Mr. Spear. Uh, Madam Mayor and members of the council, this item is a request for the city council to review, discuss, and determine an appropriate response to the grand jury report. The purpose of the response is to comply with the grand jury request. The intent of the response is to advise the grand jury as to what actions the city may take with respect to the report's recommendations. In um, January of this year, we were notified by the grand jury that it completed its grand jury final report regarding the city concerning hidden governments, joint powers, authorities in California. And the purpose of the report was to inquire into the operations of joint powers within Kern County. As a member of the joint powers authority, the city was included in the inquiry and is required to respond to the report. Specifically, the grand jury requested that the City respond to recommendations number one, number two, and number three. And those recommendations are, and I'm just going to read the headings because uh, they're included in the report, but the um, their, uh, recommendation number one is in order to improve transparency, uh, transparency uh, the grand jury is recommending that the city council request that local state rep representatives promote reform into, uh, uh, to the Joint Exercise of Powers Act, and that's identified as Government Code Section 6500. And then in uh, the heading for recommendation number two is that the, um, the city identify all joint powers authorities uh, in w to which it's a party. And recommendation number three, was that uh, all public agencies should monitor the joint powers authorities in their jurisdiction. And then they uh, list uh, the types of joint, joint powers. I have a couple of questions. Um, I'm I, I believe uh, at this time uh, that I believe our city attorney has a, a few comments. Oh, all right. Make. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Well, um, this, this comes at an interesting time since uh, we're considering entering into a joint venture. And, and um, so I took a look, close look at this report uh, to see what the comments were and, and uh, how it would impact what we're considering doing. And um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of details here and they have a lot of concerns. My overall impression is that the concern has to do with transparency and um, also, there's a concern that many of the existing rules aren't being followed by some joint powers out there. And uh, so I, I thought it might make sense to take, this, uh, take these comments and try to make sure that the joint powers we're entering into uh, sort of comply with these sort of suggestions. And, it, and you know, my belief is it will 
for example, uh, regarding uh, transparency, uh, the JPA that we're considering entering into would be uh, completely subject to the Brown Act, it would be subject to the Political Reform Act, it would be subject to uh, the, the Public Records Act. Um, they have a complaint in here that some joint powers don't have an identifiable office or place of business. My belief is that this one would have an identif identifiable office or place of business. There would probably be some kind of staff at least part-time, and probably some kind of attorney part-time that would be uh, responsible for doing a lot of legal work associated with this. So I, I think that, um, you know, we, we only have one uh, joint powers authority that we're a party to currently, and that's in relation to our pooling arrangement for insurance. And uh, again, that's a very public and visible joint powers um, uh, that's well known in the state. So. Uh, my my initial reaction to this is these are very interesting comments and they're well taken. They don't seem to be particularly germane to anything that we've got now going on or anything that we're contemplating. Wow, you did very well because those were my comments. <laughs> <laughs> I I kept thinking they're they're digging for um, questions and answers, but none of them were terribly applicable to us at this point in time. And given what we have, uh, what we're considering with the JPA, it, with to forming the GSA, I see nothing. And I think we can respond honestly and say, yes, we will be transparent. Yes, we will be have a place. Yes, we will do all this. Yes, and we are doing that now. And anything in the future, we will comply with. And my. I, that would we can safely do that. I, I think we might even, uh, if with your consent, go so far as to say that we found their document instructive while we're currently contemplating the form of a JPA, and that uh, we've taken to heart their comments about transparency, and we will ensure that um, that that's adhered to, as is required, by the way, by law. I mean, a lot of what they're complaining about is people not following the law, and uh, so we're going to follow the law. The, the only odd one from my perspective is the first request is a request that each city council, them, so a request that you request local state representatives to promote reform along these lines. I don't know how you feel about that. Um, you know, there's certainly, the grand jury's certainly free to make that request. They're not supposed to be lobbying themselves, so I guess they're asking us to do it. I suppose that's okay. Um, but, you know, I don't know what you think about that. It's, uh, you know, from my perspective, I, I think the, uh, my own personal perspective, and this is just, I, I'm wading into policy a little bit, but is that there are existing laws, and a lot of what they're complaining about is that the existing laws aren't being adhered to, which seems more of an enforcement issue from my perspective. But you're free to, you know, decide as you will. But I'm not sure how you would respond to this anyway, except, you know, we're thinking about it. Well, my question, and I think you started to answer it, is, is the one they're saying we're a member of is the insurance authority. Yeah. And, and how big is that and where does it operate? And it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a joint insurance pooling arrangement uh, for government entities. I think it's housed in Sacramento, if I'm not mistaken. It's, it's a very public and well-known uh, JPA uh, that uh, uh, is accountable to a lot of government agencies throughout the state because of the insurance. So it's, it's very prominent. It's, this is not a hidden government. Now, I, I don't um, go along with their suggestion that we should ask our uh, state officials to pass new laws. We, don't ha we are not bound by all their requests, is that correct? No, they, you know, remember the grand jury kind of has two different roles. One is to investigate wrongdoing, and when they do that, that's, you know, they, they can initiate criminal proceedings. And, and this is more, the other role they have is to review government practices and where appropriate suggest uh, uh, reforms uh, to the system. So this is more of their advisory role. So they can, they can sort of uh, ask us, and then they want to hear what our response is. I don't think, I don't know if they've got a, a right to demand we do this. I guess my response should be we're only in one 
one now, and that's very public, and we're looking at going to another one, which is being very public. We are, we appreciate their concerns, and we plan on complying with all laws pertaining to these, and that's it. Go. You're next. Uh, I, I just had a real quick one, sir. And could you use the term in enforcement, or they can enforce? Could you give me a little more insight? in reference to the enforcement that you're making reference to? Well, they, they can investigate. You're talking about the grand jury's yes, uh, writ. They, they, they're an arm of the court. They're part of the crim a criminal investigative process. So they one of their jobs is to review uh, public integrity issues that are potentially criminal in nature and then respond accordingly with uh, charges. That's not what's happening here. Okay. Okay. I, too, do, don't think that we need to um, be a political action committee. The laws are already there, and those people that, that don't uh, abide by it, it is their responsibility. It is not ours to tell them what to do. Um, I don't think we I think we can answer, as you suggested, and, and Mr. Maurer suggested that we simply say thank you, and we will do, and we appreciate it, and we've learned. Okay. Lori? I, I agree. I do have just one question, and it's only, and I'm not even sure how to word my question. In R4, when they're talking about the recommendations to the state legislature, and they're talking about, and again, this is not something we want to get into. I, I agree with my colleagues. Um, but when they say, should the code be reviewed to determine if the law provides sufficient public benefit and oversight or if tighter restrictions should be placed on the issuing of bond? And that's not something I feel we need to get into at this point in time, and I think we all support that, but I don't think that's anything we need to address in this current response that they're asking us, right? Because we, we're just going to follow the laws, and we don't need to make a recommendation to the state legislator, correct? Well, uh, for us, uh, well, 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 what we need to do is, is we do need to respond to the grand jury. Right. They're, they're not asking us to say yes. They're just asking us what our response would be to their recommendations. But for our purposes, they only are, they're limiting us to only the need to respond to the first three. Okay, right? cool. Okay, is there any other uh, yeah, public comment? Yeah, I was going to say something. I'm sorry, Jim. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, you're fine. Um, I was going to say something similar. They're only soliciting a response for recommendations one, two, and three. Yeah. Um, but as far as one, two, and three, I think these are all great suggestions, um, and it would really... I think every single one of these would help to make the JPA more transparent and um, allow for more public input. So I think these are good suggestions. Okay. Is there any public comment? Stan Rotorum. Uh, when I read the grand jury letter, I also came to the conclusion that transparency was the primary thing they were interested in. Um, and what I decided myself was the best way to show transparency would be to stick with the, I believe it was the council's original decision to use uh, Mr. Spear as the interface with the JPA. Uh, that would make sure that everything that this agency input to the JPA was thoroughly discussed before the public, before it went before the JPA. I was a little bit disheartened the last time I went to the GSA eligible agencies meeting. Um, one of, the, I think it was the lawyer, the water lawyer, said that it was the intent to have all elected officials there so that each one of those elected officials could just make up their minds at the meeting uh, on what route to go. And our, our county supervisor commented that having representatives there that couldn't vote, that, is, that, that weren't elected officials, would just slow down the process. Uh, and it would just be time consuming. And by, my personal feeling is that if it takes slowing down the process to get the process right and come to the right decisions, that's what we need to do. We don't need to have 
members of an agency as opposed to the agency being a member of the Joint Powers Agency. It should be this whole agency that is the member, and Mr. Spear is as capable as anybody to go there and voice the decision of this agency. So my feeling is in terms of transparency, transparency is best served by this agency, first of all, acting, discussing, and voting on a position, and then providing that to the Joint Powers Authority, rather than sending a person there who may or may not actually be the voice of this agency. Because my feeling is, whatever is done, the person who goes to the Joint Powers meetings needs to First and foremost, do nothing more than represent this agency as an agency, not as an individual. And I think transparency would be best served with Mr. Spear uh, and uh, Mr. Zadiba being the people that are going to the Joint Powers Authority meetings. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there any other? Well, let me just say we're, we're not talking about that particular JPA tonight, but uh, I would encourage you to attend and make those comments at the various public meetings we've got scheduled. Th that issue has yet to be decided, so. Okay, is there any other public comment? Okay, do we have direction, a motion? Do we need a yeah. motion? So that I take it I've got direction, uh, just for my own clarity, uh, since I'll be, I think, writing the letter. Uh, and the direction is we'll provide, um, with regard to R2, we'll provide the uh, reference to, that they've made it themselves to the joint power and indicate that we don't have any other joint powers. Uh, I'm not sure we've got any joint powers authorities in our jurisdiction either, so uh, that's easy. And then regarding R1, um, what I would propose is that we, we, uh, we agree with their commitment to transparency and that, uh, that we will take these comments to heart while we are crafting the new joint powers that we're considering, joint powers authority that we're considering. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. I agree. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Do we need a motion then? Uh, Let's why, do why don't you do it as a motion so I'm covered? I so move. Second. Councilmember Mauer. Aye. Councilmember Thomas. Aye. Mayor Breeden. Aye. Vice Mayor Acton. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Sanders. Aye. All approved. Okay, the next item on the agenda, I asked to be put on there, but we have gotten some information just today. And Mr. Spear, would you uh, discuss that, please? Uh, yes, this uh, particular item, uh, Madam Mayor and members of Council, this particular item was. Um, uh, well, and is uh, the discussion of the um, uh, placement of uh, logos or advertisement on military banners. Well, uh, I went down to the TAC this morning, and by the time I had gotten back, apparently Caltrans uh, District uh, 9 out of Bishop uh, had been aware of an article in the paper, at least they were aware, that this was on the agenda tonight, and they, uh, they, uh, uh, they spoke to staff and said that uh, Caltrans has a very strict policy, and their policy is that they do not permit uh, any type of advertisement or uh, logos on military banners, and that, in fact, if the council were to take action to permit that uh, uh, tonight, they would rev revoke our um, uh, permit for the banners tomorrow and require all banners to come down. And I guess just to protect themselves, uh, by 3.45 this afternoon, they sent us by email a encroachment permit writer where they decided to attach special provisions on our existing permit, I guess to just ensure the outcome. And it stipulates, oh, uh, we have a copy of that. Next page. There you go. Uh, at the, the point number one under banners, it says the banners shall not contain private advertising 
uh, nor be of a political nature. And then it lists a couple other things as well. So anyhow, I don't know, I think my recommendation, but this is subject to Council's discretion and discussion, but uh, my recommendation is, is that we would uh, perhaps be best off uh, following um, the um, uh, following the policy of uh, Caltrans with, with regard to military banners, because they're speaking, they're addressing the banners on state on the state highway, but there are banners on city streets. But and the discussion is is open to military banners, uh, you know, per se. But Caltrans is letting us know that um, we uh, they do not they have a policy, a strict policy, that they do not allow uh, the logos, advertisements, nor uh, nor, I guess, uh, any kind of political uh, messaging uh, on uh, the military banners. And I, my recommendation is, is uh, that we, we should follow suit uh, on the uh, banners that are on the, the city streets. There was a group of people here that were here. I had told them that they would, we would, this item was going to be on the agenda because when we asked last time, if it could be on the agenda, the question was, was it legal? And then the second one, it was council policy to determine whether they could or not. And so I showed them what um, Caltrans had said, and they said, great, as long as we got an answer, we know what to do. And so I think we should just either agree that we're not going to do this or, or, or uh, abide by their decision and pull the items. So whatever you all want to do, I'm happy with, well, my, and so are they. This was the banner program, people. My feeling is, is the banners are to honor our military, and I think it detracts from that honor by putting an advertisement on it. And I'd be totally against, uh, we're not trying to raise money with this, and so I don't think they should be advertising at all. There was a letter submitted that I put um, Jerry Harridan, who, who has been involved with the veterans, for a very long time and has been very strong in her support, voiced, uh, sent me an email objecting to this, should we consider that. Who, and who, who brought up putting advertising on the first They one? did, the banner program. They had a merchant who said oh, that, that he that would pay for these if, uh, if, he could if, he, if, if he would carry his advertisement and they wanted to know if it was legal. And if it was, would we approve it? And here we have our answer. Mm -hmm. So I make a motion we uh, accept their Caltrans uh, decision and not allow advertisement on the banners. Second. Third. 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 I get it out. Council Member Mauer. Aye. Council Member Thomas. Aye. Mayor Braden. Aye. Vice Mayor Acton. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Sanders. Aye. All approved. Okay, next item. Um, Committee reports. City Org and Services Committee. The City Org Committee met and we discussed broadband and um, we did kind of come up with um, a couple of steps to take because we need to know which direction to go. So staff is looking into which is going to better suit the city and its needs, whether that's looking at a utility district or a public-private partnership because the city can't gain monetarily, or profit, I should, I should say profit. So we're looking at which way is going to benefit the most, and from that, when staff brings that back, um, then we'll know which direction to go and what steps to take. And once we have that information, we can bring that back to council for council to consider and then give the go-ahead to go forth and do, and, and because we'll have to look at costs and all of those things. Um, there were a couple questions on franchise and media comm that we have to discuss. Um, and then just the partnerships, because we do have support all the way around the community, but we knew that we did. Um, and that was really all we talked about at City Org. Is there direction then it's gone to staff to come back to the org committee? Yes, it already has. Okay. It was made at the org committee. Okay. I'm anxious to see. Okay, infrastructure. Okay, uh, Jim, I wasn't at the third Thursday meeting, so if you could report that. The fourth Thursday meeting, we just voted. It was a special meeting where we voted to change the date 
from the third Thursday of the month to the fourth Thursday of the month, which will start next month. That's all we did on the... The meetings. third Thursday one was canceled because mm -hmm. we weren't having one. Oh, okay. So, yeah. so then our report is we had a special meeting on the fourth Thursday and voted to change the regular meeting date to the fourth Thursday so that our next meeting would be the fourth Thursday of March. That's okay. it. Okay. Ad hoc <laughs> water. Jim, did you want to give that? Um, yeah, actually, well, if you want to give it, you can go ahead and give it. It's a little easier not okay. being on the phone. Okay, we made a recommendation to um, staff to come back with us with quotes to, with one action item to the Xeriscape Denny's Park and see where we are with that. And when we have um, an action, a quote and a decision from staff on what to do, they will come back to us and bring it to council. And that was the only item that was that particular park because there was so many others that were involved, we wanted to see what the cost on this was. Okay, Parks and Rec and Quality of Life. We didn't really have an official meeting, but we talked to uh, Jason uh, about some of the things that are coming up. And one of the things he wanted, we talked about was the uh, concession stand uh, having its grand opening for the start of the baseball season, that they're just about finished with that project. And they're very excited about that. And then once they finish with that, they're going to move over to the Upjohn and Pearson Park to upgrade their equipment so that it is ADA in compliance. And that was our report. Okay. Ad Hoc Youth Advisory Council. Um, the youth are, are on the move. They're doing some great things. They're looking for to have a career lunching day on May the 7th. They're going to discuss different tasks that uh, certain groups can begin to do and complete their tasks, such as uh, finding a location, budgeting for their advertisement, getting in restaurants to cater their events, uh, advertisement around the schools, finding sponsors to donate to their events, and writing letters uh, of uh, interest to mentors. And the last thing they talked about was um, service projects in reference to balsam beautification projects to be put into motion the committee will meet, uh, has just met, and they will ask business of interest to, uh, can they come by and do painting and cleaning and, and those kind of things to beautify, further beautify uh, Balsam Street. And their next meeting is scheduled for March the 9th. Okay, um, the action committee? Did not meet. RACVB. Got glasses here. Yeah. Okay. Um, the there is an update on the Highway 395 sign and the turtle fencing needs to be built. The construction is scheduled to begin on April 4th. Um, there is a new intern, Lauren Petty, um, and she attended the birthday bash committee meeting for Kern County because it's their 150th birthday. Doug Luke attended the Chamber of Commerce Economic Outlook Conference. Um, and he will be attending the Film in California conference at CBS Studios in Studio City, as well as the International Pow Wow in New Orleans. Those are the upcoming events. Um, and then the RACVB team and board of director members, I can't talk, attended the LA Travel and Adventure Show held in Long Beach. 600 Ridgecrest information packs were distributed, 208 drawing entries, and over 22,000 people were in attendance from preliminary reports. Uh, for the month of February, there was a total of one production for the Ridgecrest Film Commission. In your current airport also had one production for a total of $140,000 for February. And the next meeting will be, of course, Wednesday, April 6th, and the location will be at the Kermakee Center. I have a question. How, how do you arrive at the 140000 Just, just curious. Is there a formula or something? Yeah, there's a formula from uh, American Film Association that they give us that we follow. That that 140 probably is a low number. 
Uh, I, we take each film group that comes into town and we look at the, what, what their expenditures are, how many room nights, uh, if they had any services, so it's trash, or if it's a rent free night or rentals, et cetera, et cetera. And we look at those numbers and that's what we come up with. But there is a formula. We have to give that to the state. Oh. In fact, that number doesn't go to the state. There's a higher number that they want us to put in there. But I want to be realistic. In fact, today, uh, Eddie was in the meeting. We've discussed that we're going to probably even modify it some more. We're going to dig deeper so we have some real true numbers. Because I still believe that that number that you're looking at, 140,000, is probably a little on the high side. But I have to give it my best guess because these production companies, they do not give you the numbers. It's very seldom they'll say, well, we spent this much in Ridgecrest. You just have to take a guess what they do. You know, how many, uh, like I say, how many services they use. Because it could be a four to one ratio in hotels. We, we just don't know sometimes. But we know the big productions bring a lot of money. Because you also have permit costs from BLM and from us. So that's how we arrive with that. But each, each production, I look at individually. And I break it down. And I, I look at the service because we, we see it on the permit. I appreciate that. Okay. I'm just curious. No, thank that's you. Good. Okay, other committee boards or commissions? Uh, yes, I'd like to report on Kern Cog. It's a bad report. Um, if you remember last month, I reported that they uh, the state had figured out they were underfunded on their highway projects, and so they told Kern Cog we had to cut back seven and a half million. The new figure for February was 21 million. So we have one project that's being uh, cut, uh, and that's Highway 14 between 178 here and 178 going to um, going to uh, Isabella. That was going to be four lane. Uh, it was interesting. The Caltrans rep from I don't know who's District Six. Who's, I think it's District Nine. This Bishop area. It was Bishop. Yes. Yeah, the, the Caltrans rep for Bishop 9 was there and said that um, they realized that our money was being cut and Kern County and Inyo County uh, offered $7 million, I think it was approximately $7 million towards the cost of that project. So the project may be revamped uh, depending on if they're able to figure it out. But that's, as of right now, um, the state's in dire financial situation when it comes to funding their commitments on the roads. So, and that was the bad news at Kern Cog this month. Okay. Any, Eddie, did you have any others? Lori? Just a quick um, note that the BLM meeting that is on the fourth Thursday of each month, the time has changed. And so it's actually earlier now and starting this month, March 24th, it will be from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. So that will help. And March's presentation will be on minerals and mining. Um, that will be presented by Joe Martori, who owns Sleepy Bear Mining. And if you don't know where that is, you'll see it between Garlock and Randsburg as you go out that way off of Garlock. So it's kind of an interesting project. And there's a lot going on in, in federal legislation with mining at the moment. So it's, it's kind of a good topic because the laws literally have not changed since they were first written back in the 1800s. So, and that's all I have for that report right now. Okay, the only other meeting I had was the GSA meeting, and I wanted to, re Mr. Lemieux uh, gave you most of it, but let me say for the record so everyone understands, when we were asked what we did or what we said, every response from me was, we have not discussed it at City Council, we have not made any decisions. So as far as reporting or attempting to vote for anything as Peggy Breeden, I cannot do that. So, Ms. Retro, I just want to assure you that that was not done, okay? Thank you. Okay, um, any other um, reports than the city manager's report? Uh, Madam Mayor and uh, members of the council, uh, two things. Uh, one is uh, just a reminder that the Kern Cog uh, Awards uh, present or ceremony event dinner uh, is tomorrow at 6 o'clock at the Seven Oaks Country Club. Uh, based uh, on what Lori Collins, I've never been there, but Lori Collins was telling me that that's 58 to 99 to Ming, and then you go west on Ming for a long way. Uh, when you get to Old River, then be on the lookout for Grand Lakes, yeah. uh, I think she said, and then it's immediately to your left. You turn left yeah. on Grand Lakes. And then the... Um, 
Uh, the other thing is I attended the TAC meeting um, at uh, Kern Cog this morning, and the good news on one of the items is that we, uh, uh, the well, I shouldn't say good news because this is just TAC approval. Still has to come to uh, the Kern Cog board for final approval, but uh, this, the, the CMAC pro applications that have been turned in, uh, TAC voted today on scenario number two. Scenario number two includes uh, there are, uh, I think, uh, two or three rich coach projects, but uh, the major one that's on scenario two that was approved by TAC is uh, to uh, punch Sunland through from Bowman all the way to Dolphin. And that was, uh, that was approved by TAC, but that still has to go to the board for uh, final approval. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next item is um, Mayor and Council comments. Mike? Just one comment. Uh, yesterday I had an anniversary. It was 45 years ago yesterday that I drove into this valley for the first time. And it was just as beautiful 45 years ago as it was yesterday, weather-wise. Um, we moved down here from Bridgeport. It was like 10 degrees in Bridgeport. It was like 70 degrees here, so we loved it. I'm just glad to be here. I've been, loved it ever since. Sir. Madam Mayor and Council, I just wanted to say to Mr. Harris Brocky or Mr. Harris, however he wants to be addressed tonight. Uh, thank you for coming and clarifying uh, the Petroglyph uh, Festival up because there was some information that might have been somewhat confusing in reference to one of our local papers. So thank you that Council has been made aware uh, that you're working on fine tuning those numbers. And we thank you, Mr. Doug Luke, for being here and, and clearing us up on some more financial information about this great city and our taxes. And that's all I have. Lori? I have a, goodness, I have a few. Um, I, I do want to thank um, Jim Suber for coming tonight. And um, I want to thank the public, first of all, who brought it to us. Because even though it isn't within our jurisdiction to cover, we still want to help because we love our city and that's what we do. Um, and so I just really want to thank both the public for bringing things forward and Mr. Super for coming down and being able to address it to inform us so that we can inform others, but taking, you know, time to go out with them and, and discuss and, and everybody working together to find a solution. Um, I think that's one of the great things about our community is that we always seem to do that and pull together. The, well, let's see. I want to, um, I can't get my brain to wrap around this tonight. There were some comments brought up tonight that I I, I kind of want to address, and, I, and I'm not sure if now is really a great time, but um, I know that Measure L is being bandied about as a solution to a problem, but um, I think our county has a responsibility because they have to take care of not just, I'm not talking about just city, but I, I don't believe that the public really wanted us to use Measure L for what's being bandied about in the community right now. But I need the public to let us know exactly if their feelings have changed. Because I think that if that is a discussion that we need to have, then I want it brought forward. But I think there's some other discussions that need to happen first before we go there. I'm excited about what's happening with broadband and looking forward to going there and the possibilities and getting some information together to bring that back so that we can move forward and help our city and our citizens and our community progress because that's very important and we need to do that. Just so you know, Mr. Ritora, I just want to put this out there for those who don't know. When you brought up tonight about transit information and for those who need, maybe need to get to medical and stuff, at least if you have health net for insurance, you can call and they can provide transportation and that does not cost the person anything and they will get driven to their appointments and back and somebody will wait for them. So I want to make sure that information gets out there because as you pointed out, you know, if they don't, if our bus service isn't run, running, how are they supposed to get there? Because I notice there is a lot more people and a lot more places open on the weekends. That is every day of the week, by the way. But I just wanted to put that information out there. Um, oh, the Home and Leisure Show is this weekend. So if you have time, don't forget to go. I'm missing. The road reaction yeah. Saturday. I'll let you cover that one. No, um, you can say it. Well, don't forget the Rotary Auction is also on Saturday. 
And before we meet again, there will be daylight savings time, which is not this Sunday, but the following, and it is spring forward. Other than that, I just want to thank staff for all the hard work and everything that they do, constantly stepping up for us and helping the public and us and, and finding solutions. And with that, I'll see you in two weeks. Okay, Jim, do you have anything you'd like to say? Yeah, um, just thank you everyone uh, involved in the meeting today. It was a very productive meeting, I felt, and also a very short meeting, which was awesome. Um, I'm, I'm particularly interested because I've got a 7 a.m. flight tomorrow morning, so um, I'm glad we didn't go till midnight, so thank you, everybody. We, uh, let me see here. The, the wastewater fund was mentioned that we had a $3 million loan for the solar field, uh, which was true. There was also another mention of another $3 million and it was referenced as a loan. Um, I appreciate the discussion and appreciate the, the comments that were made, but I, I do want to clarify, and this wasn't even when I was a council member, but that, um, that was never intended as a loan, as I understand it. And so I, I want to make sure the public and the council understands this, and anybody correct me if I'm wrong. But that was, that was taken out of the wastewater fund as what was intended to be a legitimate um, transfer, permanent transfer. And so I don't think that's, it's, it's proper to consider that a loan. It was, it was challenged in court and the, uh, there's a structured repayment ordered by the judge and so that's why it's being repaid. But just want to make sure that's clear. Um, I, I will be on travel for the next council meeting just to give everybody a heads up. Um, I'm not trying to avoid everybody. <laughs> I actually hate going on travel. But uh, just got to do what I got to do. So um, the Economic Devel uh, Outlook Conference I thought was, was amazing last week. So a big applause for the Chamber of Commerce and, and everybody involved for putting on another uh, great Outlook Conference. So a lot of really good things came out of that. So have a good night, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. The last item, I have a couple of items I'd like to see um, us talk about. Mr. Bruin brought up a number of comments, and I'd like to see if how we can put those on the agenda. And I'm not sure whether they need to go to committee or some discussion of what exactly, because he brought up some legitimate concerns, and I'd like to see how we can address them. Does anybody have any ideas, whether it's a committee? Because I do think that looking at Measure L is going to be terribly important to us. We cannot do without it. And maybe we need to wait a little bit for budget time before we come to that. What do you think, Dennis? Well, actually, we have uh, uh, Godby Consultants under, uh, under uh, contract right now, and they are going to uh, begin their um, uh, survey of the community as far as what the community is willing to uh, pay the sales tax for, the same as they did, uh, you know, the last time, but with the understanding uh, that uh, there have uh, we, we've been we've actually uh, been utilizing that money for um, you know for five years now, so it's it's, it's a, a renewing of this particular measure. But what they do at the conclusion of their survey is they put together the report, and then they uh, they they bring the entire uh, report before council. That that's one of the uh, in their scope of services, they bring this to council and they tell you uh, what the pulse of the community is in the different areas and where they're willing to spend their money. Is one of the questions going to be, if I didn't misunderstand what Mr. Bruin was saying, and I'm going to put this in quotes, release Measure L money for other things? Is that going to be one of the questions? They basically developed their survey, but they do have a kickoff meeting. That that particular time hasn't, uh, they haven't, uh, we haven't, don't have a specific time yet, but it'll be in the next couple of weeks, I suspect. Okay. And they, they have a kickoff meeting where, uh, well, first of all, they have their own information from their own report to refer to, but uh, if there's any changes or if there's any additional areas that they need to um, 
work into their survey, uh, they can do that. Uh, that uh, can be discussed at the kickoff meeting. Okay. Um, in, in discussion with people after the uh, Economic Development Conference, there was so much talk about TAB money that's available. I, I know we've asked for this before, but I want it down to the dollar, if you could, oh. please. Talk to us about what TAB money is available, what it can be used for, what it is already allocated for, because for some reason, people seem to think that's a golden dragon that's just shooting out money. And I want us to know what it can be used for, what it's allocated for, what is already spent, and is there any that's sitting there? A comment was made that um, the county may have taken some of our TAB money. If that is true, I'd like to know that. No, not, no. the county has taken our TAB money. The, ta uh, the county since 1314 has seen an increase in what we used to get for RDA, RDA and RDA pass-through. Uh, it's, it's a legal thing. I mean, it's they, they legally can do this, but because of the RDA wind-down, once RDA was eliminated, the rules and the legislation changed. And so starting in 1314, so 1314, 1415, now 1516, they have a money that used to come to our RDA, it used to be available mm -hmm. to us. $1.3 million is now, uh, uh, for each of those years, has been going to the county from our tax, our property tax base, if you will. And uh, as I understand it, uh, the county uh, earmarked 300000 to supplement the fire services for the community. But the other $1 million is a net to the county, what they're doing with it, I don't know. In addition to the 400000 we already pay? In addition yeah. to the 400000 we already pay, and in addition to the, the fire service uh, uh, portion that's already... Can uh, we have an item on the next agenda? I know I'm asking a lot, but sure. I really want to see where this is. And so we can either say we have unlimited money and we can do anything we want with it, or this is what we have. I think I know the first one is not a reasonable. And then the second thing I'd like to be able to address, we had a number of people who signed up, wanted to help develop options for funding the jail. Uh, I don't want to ignore those people who were kind enough to do that, and if maybe if you are at the point where you can tell us what's going on with the jail and the lack thereof. Well, well I think our uh, police chief, well, I don't you know, think, our police chief, chief actually has um, uh, options and he has a, um, uh, a plan uh, in the event that the county wants to, uh, to uh, uh, close the jail, jail and that will be part of his uh, uh, proposals uh, at, the, uh, at, our, at our budget hearings. But he has a backup plan as far as the uh, uh, the proposed closing of the jail. So we would tell these people that wanted to offer their services that they're not needed at this point in time? Well, from the city standpoint, I think that uh, the council uh, should hear the plan that uh, our uh, police chief. Uh, I agree. When are we going to have the public hearings? Uh, well, let's see. We'll, uh, I would suspect it's going to be in May for our uh, budget hearings. Okay. I would, I would, I just want to be able to offer our citizens the fact that we're not sitting here doing nothing, that we're not expecting calamities unknown to happen and the end of this fiscal year. And I, I want them to understand because many have asked me, well, so what are you doing? What are you doing? And I'm saying, I don't know. I don't know. So if we can at least tell them a little bit. Well, I think some of the, uh, some of the, the, the uh, questions, or answers rather, regarding <laughs> fiscal questions uh, will be a, a part of the media presentation at the uh, next council meeting on okay. the, this is the second, 16th. On okay, that's what I need. Okay, and then the last item, I know we've talked about this before and before and before. But where are we with the look at the money that was given to, for economic development to those, the grants? Um, where are we? Oh. We're the, uh, I don't believe at this time we've had a, uh, a response. Oh, there was one response. We had one response saying that they would be providing the information. But the other time responded to our initial letter from the attorney. See, 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 a, 
Right, our attorney, uh, our attorney, in fact, sent out a letter for the self-certification uh, for okay. the recipients of the uh, uh, economic development dollars, tab okay. dollars, and as Gary just indicated, we've only had one response at this time. Okay, I would encourage us to follow up. I know, I'm sure you are. Okay, that's all I have. I thank you all. I'll see you uh, out and around, and thank you for your attending. Uh, meeting is adjourned.